Okay, Anna. I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. Sorry. We're recording, Lynn. All right, thank you. Um, good evening. It is June 26th, 2023, and this is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law has been extended. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. However, I do wanna note that at this point, we in fact have a quorum of the council in the room. Um, what we, at the same time, we provide the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. They can be here in real time and we have a couple people in our audience tonight, welcome. This meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, by phone, and is a live broadcast on Amherst Media, Channel 9, and through live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the June 26, 2023 town council meeting to order at 631. I'll call on each counselor to make sure that they can hear and we can hear them. Uh, and then please make sure you mute your mic again. Uh, we'll start with Shalini Balmilne, who I believe is absent. Um, Pat DeAngelis? Present. Anna Devlin Gothier? Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Joe Haneke? Present. Anika Lopes? Present. Michelle Miller? Not present yet. Okay. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Here. Pam Rooney? Here. Kathy Shane? Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Todd. Present. And Alicia Walker. Here. And so please keep an eye out for anybody else. And I'm quickly checking the audience on Zoom. Thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know to make a comment or ask a question. Counselors, please use the raised hand function. And during public comment, the same rules apply. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, we'll decide at the time how to address that, whether we have to suspend the meeting or make note of it in the minutes. There is no change in the order of the agenda as posted at this time. We'll go on to the announcements. I just wanna note that we have listed the rest of the council meetings through the rest of the summer. We are still holding August 7th as an if needed and if we have a quorum. Uh, and we so we meet on July 17th, August 21st, September 11th, and then actually again on September 18th. Committees continue to meet and their schedule is below. And while we've had a robust number of activities, around town for the last several months, things have kind of quieted down for summer, but please enjoy things like the concert, concert on the common and the farmer's market. We're going to move directly to general public comment. There is a special public comment period about ARPA funds. So we're going to do just general public comment for this time. So if you are in the physically in the audience, please make sure that you have signed in with Athena. If you are in the Zoom, where we have 10 attendees at this time, and you would like to make general public comment, not about the ARPA funds, please raise your hand at this time. Okay, Athena? First, we have e Eve Vogel. Please come to the microphone. State state your name and address before your comment. Eve, name and address and also where you live. Okay. Address isn't where I live. No, <laughs> name and address. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry. No problem. Um, okay. Hi, my name is Eve Vogel. I live on Harlow Drive off East Pleasant, 135. I served for over 10 years on town transportation committees and have driven, walked, biked, and ridden the bus in Amherst for 15 years, often when my, when my past then young son was in tow. Earlier today, I sent the council longer written comments. Others attending this meeting can see my comments as a letter to the Amherst Indy. 
I am here to urge you to vote no on the draft streetlights policy as it is currently written. It aims to address an important goal, to reduce unnecessary nighttime light, which can affect human health, interfere with wildlife, and make it harder to see the night sky. The problem is that if the policy is passed as currently written, it will unintentionally threaten pedestrian and bicycle safety, and it will make it much more difficult for the town to build out a safe pedestrian and bicycle network. Why does this matter? Pedestrians and bicyclists are three to seven times more vulnerable to fatal accidents in the dark than during daylight hours. <clears throat> Children are particularly vulnerable and minority communities experience disproportionate impact. More lighting not only improves safety, it also increases comfort and confidence, increasing the use of walking and bicycling paths. Lighting is important not only during the dark, but also during low visibility weather. In my fuller comments, I described three of the fatalities in the last decade that happened at night in Amherst. <clears throat> Many more people have been injured by drivers who did not see them in the dark. I spoke to one of the policy's proponents when she came to a TAC meeting. <laughs> um, I was reassured that the intention of the policy was in no way to interfere with needed lighting for safety. The problem is, despite the intention, this draft policy will interfere with safety. The key reasons are the unbalanced language of the draft policy and cost. As an example, think of North Pleasant Street, north of the UMass campus, where one of the fatalities I wrote about occurred. It has some of the highest crash rates in Amherst. Have you ever walked or biked up that street heading north in the dark or even in the rain? It's hard to see, especially if you're on the east side sidewalk that's covered by trees with the lights on coming from the other side. Um, the best way to meet both safety standards and reduce unnecessary night lighting is to have low and frequent pedestrian scale light posts. But to do that up and down that stretch of North Pleasant, much less add it to the other corridors in Amherst where we want bike and pedestrian primary routes you need to is cost prohibitive. <clears throat> Okay. The choice then is to use the utility poles where lights must be mounted high and to have lights stretch across and along the street to eliminate both sidewalks and the road in between. The light must also spread between lampposts in order to provide <clears throat> um, continuous illumination, which is essential to bicyclists and important to bet pedestrians. So please wrap up, please. Okay. The policy can be fixed. The ideas and the details are good. Two things are needed add equally specific safety performance standards, and add provisions to the policy that have considerations and processes to balance the trade-offs among safety, limiting unwanted light, and cost. I've also sent to the council a sample marked up policy that could do this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. There were a couple people who came in later. If you want to be here for general public comment, not specific to ARPA, please make sure that you've signed up with Athena who is over here. Later on, we'll do public, specific public comment with related to ARPA, okay? Uh, there are two hands at this point in Zoom. Uh, please bring Emily Lutelia. And I'm going to ask you to state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Emily Boudelier. I live on 36 Chestnut Street. And should I start talking now? Please, please. Okay. Please. <laughs> I want to express strong support for the streetlight policy. I think that it, I would be really proud to live in a town that took a leadership role in this. I've been researching um, light pollution, light trespass for a few years, and I think that this would have this would make a great impact both locally and in helping the national and international problem. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there anybody else in the audience, Athena, for general public comment? Yes, the next person we have is a resident of Leverett, so we usually keep those to the end, just letting you know. Um, not for general public comment. Next is uh, Pat Ananabaku. Did you want to make general public comment? No. Vera Cage, did you want to make general public comment? Please come forward. Hi, my name is Vera Cage, and I live at 12 Longmeadow Drive in Amherst. I'm here to talk about the Drake 
Um, the Drake received $300,000 in ARPA funding, but they couldn't figure out how to put up a ramp to their stage. Um, I'm questioning how it came to this point after a whole year's worth of operation that they are now applying for a variance with the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board. I was very surprised to frequent the Drake one evening and I questioned um, the town manager, Paul Balkaman, who sits on the board of the business improvement district. And um, he also um, has donated to the Drake as well as some of you folks here in the town council. Um, and I just want to figure out how one establishment in town who's also listed as a nightclub could not get away with a temporary ramp that could be pulled away. Yet the Drake was allowed that ability. So I'm questioning the integrity of our building commissioner um, about his thought process on that. Um, and I'm interested in what the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board will do um, with respect to the Drake's application for a variance to be okay with the law around accessibility. Um, that is my general comment. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We're going to go again to Zoom and please bring in James Lowenthal. Hello. And if uh, you will go ahead and state your name and where you live. Yes, thank you. Uh, my, my name is James Lowenthal and I am a resident of Northampton. Is it appropriate for me to speak now? Is this regarding general public comment or is it regarding ARPA sp spending? It's regarding the uh, proposed lighting uh, policy. Please go ahead. You have no more than three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Lowenthal. I, I live in Northampton. I am uh, the president of the Massachusetts chapter of Dark Sky. And uh, I am also on the American Astronomical Society's uh, uh, Committee for the Protection of Astronomy and uh, the Space Environment. And I chair the Light Pollution Committee of that organization. And I also uh, lead uh, efforts to combat light pollution at the international level. Um, the proposed ordinance, uh, the proposed uh, policy for Amherst is uh, consistent with current best practices. It is by no means um, putting Amherst out on a limb. Um, there are over 50 cities and towns around Massachusetts that already have some kind of uh, uh, protection of the night sky. And uh, Amherst's current policy regarding its lighting is woefully out of date. And you can see the evidence of that by walking around town. We all know that to use a flashlight properly, you point the flashlight at the ground, not in your own face. And yet what Amherst currently has is a lot of public street lights poking everybody right in the face. That's bad lighting. And it's ineffective and worse, it's dangerous. I also am a transportation uh, advocate. I helped uh, found Northampton's Transportation and Parking Commission. I sit on its bicycle and pedestrian committee. I'm very familiar with bike uh, ped safety issues. And I can guarantee you that the number one problem at night with visibility is the, the same effect, the flashlight effect, glare. It's light that pokes you in the eye and limits your visibility. It ruins your visibility when it should be helping. All outdoor light at night should be shielded effectively against glare. And that is one of the major points of the proposed ordinance. We have way more than enough light already. It's not a question of the amount. There is so much light out there, it never gets dark in Amherst anymore. It's at least five times brighter than natural on a typical night in Amherst. There's more than enough light. The problem is it's not going in the right direction. It's not controlled for glare. It's not controlled for color. Whenever you go out tonight and see a bright blue light poke you in the eye, that's glare, that's reducing visibility. So I wanna speak in favor of the proposed ordinance. Uh, it has some very basic uh, vanilla flavored uh, aspects that are recommended for best practices, 
not just here uh, in the Valley, not just in Massachusetts, not just around the country, but around the world. And uh, a lot of care and, and attention has gone into it. It's gone through many iterations. And I hope you'll find that, uh, that the 10% worsening of light pollution uh, around the world every year is enough cause. And if, you, if you're not sure about that, please turn to the current issue of Science Magazine. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other people in the audience, Athena? Okay. And we have nobody else in Zoom. I just wanna mention that at this point, we have 19 people on Zoom and we have 10 people who have joined us in the audience tonight. Um, we are going to go on to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is pretty straightforward, gang. It's to approve an appointment for the Conservation Commission and two, two agendas, two um, sets of minutes. So the, uh, I'm going to make the motion, and if there's anybody who would like to remove an item, please do so. You do not need a second. Uh, to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. 9A1, approval of town manager appointments to the Conservation Commission. 11A, approval of June 12, 2023, regular meeting minutes. And 11B, approval of June 12, 2023, town council public forum meeting minutes. Is there any requests for any removals? Is there a second? Second, Devlin got there. Thank you. Okay, we're going to begin. Um, Shelney Balmill is absent. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Did Michelle Miller join us? No, thank you. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Uh, here. Pam Rooney? Yes, yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. That Can I clarify that Dorothy Pam's vote was thank you. Dorothy. abstain or yes or no? It is. It, my vote is a yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks for that clarification, Dorothy. Thanks. We have no resolutions and proclamations tonight. So we are going to move on to the next item. And let me just explain how we're going to approach this item. This is the presentation with regard to the American Rescue Plan Act funds that we and other municipalities all across the country have received. This is an initial presentation. There will be a follow-up opportunity on Monday, July 17th, based on questions that are asked tonight of both the audience and the council. The plan tonight is to have the town manager and the finance director provide a presentation on the status of our ARPA funds, what have been, what's been spent, what's not been spent, et cetera, and how we might move forward. I will then turn to the town council to see if you have clarifying questions, not changes, just clarifying, okay? We will then have a specific public comment period with a three minute limit to all people that want to speak and an invitation to submit written comments at any point in time, which is always open. We'll return then to the council to ask additional questions so that they can ask additional questions or indicate information they would like prior to our July 17th meeting. All counselors will be asked to send questions also to the town manager following tonight's presentation. So with that, I'm going to call on town manager, Paul Bockelman and finance director, Sean McConnell. Great, thank you, Lynn. And thank you for this opportunity to talk about where we are with the funding of the um, use of funds of the, from the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, which we'll always be calling it ARPA tonight, which is the common term that we use. Um, it's our opportunity to give, give you an update on the status of the funds 
and how they've been utilized and what hasn't been done yet and what we're thinking of for the next, um, next round of funding. We always anticipated two rounds of funding, the first one and round two, which is where we're headed towards now. And our goal tonight is to present what we, some ideas that we have and to welcome feedback on those ideas. The funds that we've been utilizing have been aligned with the goals of the town council. That was our, always our first metric and to meet the needs of the town and its residents and businesses. We also utilize funds to take advantage of strategic opportunities that um, were aligned with the council's goals, such as purchasing the VFW site for a future home for a homeless shelter with supportive house, supporting services. We are very grateful for these funds from the federal government. Um, we're very proud of how we've stepped up during the, how we've allocated these funds and how the entire town has stepped up during the pandemic, during the recovery. Um, we are in excellent shape as a town, primarily because of the hard work put in um, by our community and uh, by our staff. So while we know that we are on good footing, there are still more challenges that need to be met. And we're gonna talk about some of those things. So next slide. So tonight, we're gonna give you a little bit of background and we're gonna talk about the status um, of where we are. And Sean is gonna do that part. Then um, I'll come back and we'll talk about the round two plan and then ask you for questions. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. And I do wanna thank uh, Finance Director Sean Mangano and Leah Carver from the Finance Department who've been managing this. While the funds are a blessing, it also takes a lot of work to conceptualize, to build programs, to develop applications and, and to monitor the spending and make sure all the money is spent appropriately. It's complicated, it's time consuming, and I will match our work that we've done against any other community in the state. We do this with the expectation that we will be audited at some point by the federal government. So to that end, we are being very careful about how we make our decisions and the documentation that we require. Sometimes I can seem onerous, but it's really important for us because we are trying to limit the liability of the town so that if we are, we don't wanna be allocating funds that we can't justify. So for background, we received $11.9 million in ARPA funds. Uh, and just for a reference point, the city of Northampton received twice as much money. Um, so while it's a lot of money to us, there are a lot of communities that have, they are able to do a lot more with ARPA funds. The funds that we have have to be obligated by December 31st, 2024, meaning they have to be either spent or under contract. And that seems a long ways away, but it really isn't given the speed of, of local government. The first tranche that we talked about was 9.8 million and we purposely held back $2 million with the understanding that at some point, not all $9.8 million would be spent and that would come back into the pool. Um, the, the funding plan is based on community outreach, outreach and, and working with the town and with the town council. And everything that is, is on our website under our ARPA page, so it's, it's very transparent. So now we're back. Next slide. So Sean is now going to give a sort of update on our different um, groupings of what we've spent and what we haven't spent. And we've tried to sort of show this in graph form to make it easy, and then we summarize it at the end. Thanks, Paul. Um, so yeah, we've grouped uh, the projects by category. Um, and then on each slide, you'll see a pie chart that summarizes the total amount allocated to that category, um, how much has been obligated and how much is unobligated. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, obligated means that it's either been spent, um, encumbered, meaning it's under contract or a purchase order, um, or it's projected to be spent. We have things some uh, projects that are payroll based, so we can't really encumber them specifically, but we're projecting to spend them. Um, and if it's unobligated, it essentially means that we are saying it's not projected to be spent at this point, and so it's available to go to round two. Uh, so for this first uh, category, which is public health and safety, uh, two, 2.3 million was allocated in total, um, and about 50% of that is obligated, about 50% uh, we're expecting to go to round two. Uh, public health staffing was used to make our public health nurse, which was a 0.8 position, bring that to full time and to hire a full time administrative position that um, both of those things have happened and, and all those funds are expected to be spent. Uh, public health translation services was to uh, work with a contractor to have a translation uh, capability when people call the public health department. 
Um, our public health director has uh, done that, and so that capability is available. And by, uh, so far, we hear that it's working well. Fire and EMS staffing was to hire four additional firefighter positions. That, that has been done. Um, we don't anticipate spending all of that money because our goal uh, from the beginning has been to incorporate those four positions into our operating budget as soon as we can, because those are permanent positions that we anticipate will continue. Um, and so we want to get them off of grant funds as soon as we can. Um, so some of the money that is unobligated is uh, coming back from this section. Mental health services um, was again to partner uh, with a contractor to uh, provide some mental health services in town. Um, much of that need has been taken care of by the DPH grant um, and by some of the ESSER funds that the schools have received that they have put towards mental health. Um, so that money is planned to go back to round two. Crest implementation was to support that new department as it kicked off. Again, same thing because of the DPH grant, which has covered uh, the majority of the implementation costs for CRESS. Um, much of that funding is going to round two. And then premium pay was um, payment for some employees who had uh, particular exposure to COVID-19 during the pandemic. Um, this program has been done for a little bit. Um, and so that uh, project's complete. Um, and there's some funds that are coming back from that that will go to round two. The next uh, category is resident aid programs. Um, so all the funds in this category anticipated to be spent. Um, the first project was the survival center. There was 150,000 um, allocated to continue the meal delivery program. Uh, they had some other funding sources that were winding down and then this funding would pick up uh, to con continue this program for the foreseeable future. Uh, the resident emergency aid program had $150,000 allocated as well. Uh, this was to support households um, that were behind on their mortgage or utilities or rent. Um, and this program has been very successful. We've helped um, approximately 80 households. Uh, you can see the demographic breakdown to the right. Um, it was optional whether uh, people identified the race as they applied or households identified the race as they applied. So there's, there's an unidentified category, but you can see it's a pretty diverse allocation of grant funds. Um, and this program, we're actually, you'll hear more later on from Paul, but we're increasing the funding for this program by 50,000 because uh, the first 150,000 has been used up um, and there's there still have been ongoing applications coming in. Uh, homelessness support was used, uh, was allocated to help identify a permanent shelter for, home, uh, for, for the homeless and also for transitional housing. Um, as Paul mentioned earlier, we've uh, secured a site now uh, for a future permanent shelter, um, which will help us seek state and federal funds and, and accelerate that process and address a long time goal of the council. And then senior center transportation, uh, thanks to our senior center director who was able to get a uh, used PVTA van uh, donated to the town, an accessible van donated to the town. Um, these funds have been used primarily for drivers to drive that vehicle. Um, and bring seniors to the senior center and to medical appointments. Next is housing. So there was a million dollars allocated for housing, uh, also expecting to spend all of that. Um, the majority of this uh, million dollars has been earmarked for uh, the East Street School and the Belchertown Road site, um, which will create 70 new units, uh, over half of which will be affordable. Um, and there still will be funding left over, hopefully to support another project somewhere in town. Infrastructure, there's a, a number of projects here. Uh, cybersecurity, there were funds allocated uh, for our IT department to uh, do an assessment and to beef up our cybersecurity posture, um, especially in light of uh, what's been going on in municipalities across the state. Uh, there were funds for capital projects management to either hire temporary staff or a designer um, to help implement some of our capital projects. We have a number of projects, uh, both in ARPA and non-ARPA, um, that we need some additional capacity to help get them started and moving, um, and that's what those funds are for. Enterprise support, uh, this was to fill in lost revenue in the sewer fund and in our parking enterprise fund uh, early on during the pandemic when the university closed. Uh, both of those enterprise funds saw the revenues drop uh, suddenly. And so this one's been done for a while, but that's what that was for. Uh, public Wi-Fi, we received a different grant, not ARPA, uh, to upgrade the downtown Wi-Fi system. 
Um, that is almost complete. Uh, we hope over the summer that, uh, that this upgrade will be completed. Um, and these funds are being used to supplement that project and then expand Wi-Fi to other locations like parks um, where outside of the downtown area um, and bring that additional coverage. Likewise, municipal fiber, the town is a project um, to build out a fiber network uh, connecting all the municipal buildings. Um, and these funds were used to add additional strands to that network so it's more flexible and can do more in the future, um, possibly have more extensions of where it can go. Um, and if there's any funds left over in this category, uh, it will be used to um, connect additional locations that were not in the original scope. Uh, trails money was used to repair uh, trails that were heavily used during the pandemic. And the downtown public restroom, we've heard a lot about uh, needing a publicly accessible restroom that was not you know, attached to a restaurant. Um, we believe we've identified a location near Kendrick Park. Um, and so this is one of those projects that uh, we hope to bring on temporary staff to help us lead this project through uh, the design phase and, and complete this project. Um, it'll have to go through all the steps of any uh, public facility. So. so all of these funds are expected to be spent. The next category is education and childcare. Um, so there was about 150,000 allocated for preschool and after school. Uh, the preschool funds um, have been used to support three and four year olds with social, emotional and behavioral um, challenges, especially those that may have been caused by the pandemic and by having disruptions in their, um, in their care and their education. Um, we're partnering with the preschool at Crocker Farm um, for that project. After school, uh, those funds are being used uh, to provide transportation uh, for students to attend after school care um, during some of our vacation weeks and also to provide subsidies for students to attend um, the vacation camps that we have that operate during February and April vacation. The early childhood expansion program, there's 300,000 that was uh, going to be a grant program for child care providers to um, increase the number of slots that they uh, can offer in town. Um, we had high hopes for this program. We were hoping that this would result in a, um, a large increase in the number of uh, slots that might be available for, for Am Amherst residents. Um, unfortunately, there was a general um, lack of interest when the applications were due. And so we decided uh, not to move forward with that program. And so those funds will go back to round two. And then the sixth grade transition, originally we had allocated a large sum to the, to the regional schools to support bringing the sixth grade, um, actually the elementary school, sixth grade, uh, the elementary school is to bring the sixth grade up to the middle school, uh, was gonna cover some operational costs and some facility costs. Uh, but due to that uh, transition being delayed until after the, the new school is open, um, those funds have come back and we'll go to round two. Climate impact, there was 510,000 allocated here. Um, the majority of this pot was for the heat pump program to provide financial incentives for um, particularly low income households to convert their heating systems from a fossil fuel heating system to a heat pump type program. Uh, this project is starting to take off. We're uh, finalizing a solicitation for a consultant to administer the program for us um, and to help provide the education and outreach. So uh, we hope this is a program that will kick off in the second half of this year. Uh, other projects that were included here were uh, two sustainability fellows to work with um, Stephanie Ciccarello. They're helping with the uh, um, assessment of municipal facilities and some other projects that she's got going on. Um, this funding is being used to create a community dashboard to monitor the different strategies in the climate plan and the town's progress towards uh, completing those strategies. Um, that work has begun. We've uh, contracted with a company who is developing that now. Uh, these funds are also being used to support the mobile market and um, Fort River Community Farms. Um, and lastly, will also be uh, be used for um, for to complete a inventory of our municipal fleet and the greenhouse gas emissions from that our fleet, and then come up with a transition plan uh, to move us off of those fossil fuels. Uh, so most of these things are underway, uh, and we hope to get them complete in the next six months or so. The the heat pump program will be a longer running program, though. 
diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we allocated funds for Amherst Recreation uh, to better serve um, children in the community that um, during our, our listening sessions, we heard there were some gaps in, in service. Um, they're still in the planning phase for how to deploy those funds. Youth empowerment, there was 500,000 um, uh, to help with the creation of a, a center and a program. Um, I think the town manager is gonna be kicking that process off uh, in the near future, a group to um, start moving that project forward. Community engagement was initially for the, our ambassadors. Um, and as our ambassador program has been phased out, it's been supporting community engagement more broadly. And then the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, before it was approved by the town council and funded in the uh, actual budget, um, we had started uh, the department uh, with one staff member and these funds helped pay for that staff member until the, the budget included a new appropriation. Um, so all these funds are anticipated to be spent um, and yeah, nothing will be going around to from this section. And then the last section is economic development. So there are three projects here. Uh, small business grants had $100,000. Um, $65,000 was for growth and startup grants. Uh, and the other $35,000 was for technical assistance. Um, of the, the growth and startup grants, we've allocated and awarded pretty much all of them at this point, $64,000. Um, you can see the breakdown um, of those grants. So 95% have been awarded to businesses owned by uh, with a margin uh, owner identified as marginalized, which we've defined as uh, BIPOC, LGBTQ, or women owned, and 5% to non-marginalized. And then the breakdown between BIPOC and non-BIPOC, 55% uh, to businesses owned by a BIPOC individual, and 45% to non-BIPOC. Um, and I think the more impressive thing with the small business grant program is that it's awarded grants to over or to 18 uh, businesses. Um, many of which, if you walk downtown, you'll you'll see. Uh, the downtown entertainment venue, um, the Drake. So there were funds allocated there, three hundred thousand. Um, the the about half of that was for infrastructure improvements, and the other half was for programming. Uh, the programming piece is still being spent. Uh, the infrastructure, the biggest piece there, and that's it's all been spent at this point, was for HVAC. Um, again, this was as we were coming out of the pandemic. We invest in the HVAC system. Uh, to support the, the, a safe air quality um, situation in an indoor performing arts venue. And then economic empowerment, there was uh, 350,000 allocated here. Um, we had high hopes for this program. It was gonna be used to uh, support entrepreneurship in town, um, arts and artists and, and performing artists, and uh, to build on some of our partnerships with UMass. Um, we're gonna be able to do some of those things through other means, but uh, the biggest challenge we ran into with this project was um, finding a staff person to do it, um, to implement it consistently, and we were unable to do that. Um, and so these funds will largely come back and go to round two. So in summary for round one, uh, one of the lenses that we look at uh, these projects to see if they were successful is what type of lasting impact will they have. Um, some of the programs in in round one were for sort of immediate assistance and that's okay. That was uh, one of the intentions for the program was to provide immediate relief. Um, but we also wanted to make sure some of the things we did have a, had a lasting impact and achieved uh, goals of the town council. Um, some of those things uh, include our location for permanent shelter, um, the affordable housing development, uh, the youth empowerment program and a public restroom facility, um, the downtown performing arts venue and the impact that has on the downtown and, and supporting other businesses. Uh, increased adoption of heat pump te technology, and then again, our Wi-Fi municipal fiber infrastructure, which is really the, uh, the backbone of our communications network as we go forward. Um, we hope there will be additional ones we can add to this list when round one is complete. There's still money there, um, so there may be some more things to add to this list. Um, but in total, $7 million was expended, encumbered, or projected to be spent in round one, which leaves $2.8 million uh, to shift to round two, in addition to the um, existing two million that was already there. And I will turn it back to Paul. Great, thanks, Sean. So 
when we look at what we should be trying to accomplish with round two of the funds, the first thing we thought about was, you know, there has been talk at the federal level about clawbacks. If you have, you know, for cities and towns that haven't spent their money, that they would claw it back, take it away. So we have a, a strategy in, in mind that for rapid action, were that to happen, uh, but we're hoping that we don't have to do the, the uh, allocation. We'd rather use it through the ARPA process. Um, the second was to minimize new, pro new programs so that when they are instituted, they don't create new fiscal cliffs, new operational demands on our budget. Um, we want there to be a clear path beyond ARPA. If we're putting something together, we want there to be a clear path to support that program going beyond the extent, the, um, the expiration of this program. And then the third thing was to support the um, goals that the council had already identified or that had been identified through studies that the town had, had done um, and or have been articulated during the JCPC process or some other um, study that the town has done. And then the last thing was to reduce um, the long-term operating costs of the town, if we can use things to make us more efficient um, and be able to recapture the funds that, that, that were not going to be utilized uh, to support these primary goals. Next slide. So here are some projects that we've already committed ourselves to uh, in round two. First is um, the need for a consultant for the resident oversight board consultant. Um, this is uh, $100,000 to help us create the resident oversight board that was uh, recommended by the Community Safety Working Group. Uh, our DEI director felt very strongly that we needed outside support. This will be the first oversight board that's been created after post. Um, and we really wanna make sure it's done right and effectively and has longstanding uh, stature. The second was um, to support an immediate need that had high urgency, which was to support the replacement of pump four under our wastewater system. The council had already allocated funds, um, but we had needed the additional funds to complete this project. The third is $250,000 to make improvements to recreation areas. As Sean mentioned, our recreation areas had intense usage during ARPA or during the pandemic and we're really suffering from this, the usage that was being done. So we were taking, allocating funds to support, you know, just basic improvements to our um, bathhouses and some other park areas that we really needed to invest in. Uh, we also recognized in working with family outreach that there was a, a significant need for the heavily utilized program to aid residents on, who are behind on rent or mortgage or utility bills. And so we allocated $50,000 um, for that. And then we settled on $100,000 to close out the CARES and FEMA funds. So if you recall, we also had CARES and FEMA money that we put as many um, costs as we could. Then we submit that to the federal government. And then you know, we, have, we, we had a very high success rate, but some, some of those costs are rejected and we have to then find another source to fund those costs. So those are the things that we have already committed ourselves to. Um, and so some of the things that we are talking about, and this is where we're really welcoming your feedback. Uh, as we thought about this, we really wanted to have significant impact going forward. Um, so the first is to um, install a solar canopy at the high school. This was one of the highest rated priorities in the townwide solar assessment. It would reduce the operating costs for the high school. It may qualify for tax credits um, under the, uh, the IRA program uh, for the for the state for the federal government, um, clean energy obviously, and we also think it would be a highly visible, impactful project and a location uh, again that was identified in our Cadmus report. Um, this was a request that the students from the high school brought to the council. Um, it's a very expensive project, but we think that this would be a game changer for the town and something that would well be needed. It's, a, it's not an easy project. We have to repave the parking lot. We have to install everything. We have to work out a lot of agreements with the, with the region to understand exactly what our, what our um, relationship would be if the town puts money into this. The second is sort of a companion to the Teen Empowerment Center. 
we have not, on the Teen Empowerment Center, we have not made the progress we had hoped to make. So uh, we are sort of backing up and going to take a new approach because that is something that's a important priority for the town, uh, for, uh, for the Youth Empowerment Center, and moving that forward with more community involvement as we move that forward. Concurrently, we also recognize that we will not have a new senior center given the sort of demands on our capital pro projects with the DPW fire library and school, you know, in, in, in the queue to be built, I don't anticipate we will, we will have funds for a new senior center in the near future. So in the meantime, um, we need to address the needs of the seniors by upgrading the space at the Banks Community Center and important to, to the uh, community, to the senior center was a functional kitchen that would be actually be used by any members of the community um, that we put in the large activity room and to um, have a um, exercise room for seniors. They have the equipment, they don't have a useful exercise room. It will require reallocating space at the Banks Community Center. We have done some work on that. We need to do more work and also consult with the senior, with the senior center staff and the Council on Aging. But this again, you know, is a stopgap measure that will meet the needs of seniors um, for the time for the time being. Um, the, the third thing is community grants. Now, when we set up the original ARPA uh, program, we did not offer community grants. And these are grants to nonprofit organizations, um, other groups that um, might have uh, a mission that, that the ARPA funds could alloc be allocated to. So this, we wanna put some money aside to um, offer this up to community groups who could apply and be awarded this to achieve the, the function, the um, goals of their organization. We've had many um, groups come to us saying, we, could add, we would like to allocate ARPA funds for this or that. This would be the opportunity. And it's, these are all, um, you know, if you're a nonprofit organization, um, then this, this would be something that you'd be able to access. Um, and then the last one um, is the roads and sidewalks. You hear about roads and sidewalks all the time. You could take all of the ARPA money and put it into roads and sidewalks if you so chose. But, but you know, this is something we want to have as being like every, everything that we don't spend would wind up going into repairing our roads and sidewalks. Next slide. So for tonight, we're eager to hear from you. We're in listening mode. Uh, do you support these projects? Do you think we're on the right track? If not, what track would you like us to go on? Are there any ideas that you have that we haven't thought about? Uh, and this is not just to the council, it's primarily to the council because you're our, our boss, but it's also to the general public and we're eager to hear from you. And then the idea is that during the course of the next few weeks prior to the next council meeting, you will send us you know, your ideas. If you have specific questions, you will formulate those questions and we can come back to you with more detailed answers and then have another conversation come July 17th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so as planned, I'm going to turn to the council and just ask, do you have clarifying questions about how the money has been spent? Not so much about future expenditure. I think that's more the second conversation. Pat. Thank you. I would love a uh, clarification. Use your mic, please. I have it on. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Speak into it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Never enough. That's right. <laughs> um, I'm interested in um, the Youth Empowerment Center, $500,000. Now, I'm, was, I don't, let me see my notes. How can you clarify what what has happened with that so far? What's what's the process for the? Yeah, so we anticipated that we would move that forward primarily with staff, um, given our staff turnover and the sort of a lot of new people, new positions. We just didn't make progress on it, and um, so now I'm we're I want to back up and sort of create a community group that has representatives from different uh, boards and committees that will drive this a little more aggressively. And then that will help move, the, move this forward on our agenda. Um, I think with a oversight group of some sort that will help this, I think it, it, 
gives us clarity and what where it's going and it gives us more community involvement and what the options are and then we will um hopefully get something forward back to to the council quickly and so that money is there for that the money is there for five hundred thousand dollars right and again i think that this this isn't going to buy a new teen, a youth empowerment center it will get us something that'll last us until we are in a position to build a brand new yeah, center i understand that thank you okay these are clarifying questions uh dorothy um I'm interested to know why we received so much less money than uh, Northampton did. Was that because they don't count students the same way or um, it just seemed like a very interesting question. Um, so I'd love to hear some more about that. Thank you. Let me speak right. to that, Paul. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, we it's, were very, it's a bone of contention with us to so we you know. very, very angry about it, uh, Dorothy. <laughs> um, so once upon a time, um, Northampton somehow was categorized as a metropolitan city. Um, typically, you have to have over 50,000 uh, residents to, to meet that or get that uh, classification. Um, somehow, they still got it without hitting that that mark. Um, but because they were classified as a metropolitan city, uh, metropolitan cities split a different bucket of money than everybody else. Um, so they were in, they got an allocation from one pool of money that was split among uh, metropolitan cities and everybody else was called a non-entitlement unit or an NEU, which we, where we fell um, and we split up everything that was left. Um, so that's why they got so much more as they were classified differently than we were um, and split up a different bucket of funds. Um, again, this is to Lynn. Will we have a chance to make another, uh, to make a comment on this topic today? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. After we do public comment, then we're going to return to the council to okay. talk about our thoughts on different things. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Certainly. Are there any other counselor clarifying questions? Jennifer. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I just, um, so with the Drake, I, I am a supporter, I contributed. So I'm just asking, um, that was a priority for the town, but it, so it wasn't, I guess what I'm asking is the money wasn't given to the bid and then the bid decided to give it to the Drake. That was something that was a priority of the town. I think there's some confusion there. Yeah, I can I, answer that. Um, okay, so, thank you. Yeah, so the Drake was a separate project from the small business grants. Um, the Drake was uh, viewed as sort of a unique economic opportunity um, and really to support um, the arts and culture industry in town. When we looked at Amherst and um, sort of what drives its economy, that's one of our major sectors and was really impacted by the pandemic. So that was viewed as a, its own project, completely separate from the small business grant program. Um, and it, it didn't go through the bid to them. It was went straight from the town to them. Okay, thank you. If, you. if you think back to where we were at that moment in time, nobody knew what the what the future was holding for the for the town. And one of the things that people identified is the need for a real um, venue that is open to the public to utilize uh, to generate more um, activity downtown. Alicia. Um, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned briefly about ARPA funding going to support three and four year olds with social emotional challenges. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and what exactly that means? Um, so one of the things we heard is that the delays and some of the disruptions caused uh, from the pandemic and just inconsistent. Um, uh, uh, education from either um, being remote or in person um, has caused caused a variety of challenges for students. Um, and so these funds were uh, to provide some targeted intervention um, to address those needs. Um, I, I, the preschool will give you a better explanation than I will. It was a proposal from the from the school system. Okay, and I just generally meant like, did, was it like hiring more staff? Was it like providing different services? It, it was, uh, my understanding is generally it's been used to hire contractors um, to work with students. Um, the, the 
preschool has limited staffing. And so this is to work with some of our contractors that we work with uh, typically um, to provide some additional intervention services. Okay, thank you. And then my next question was about um, the subsidies for transportation. And I was hoping you could also elaborate a little bit more on what that means. Um, so there, there were sort of two separate things and um, uh, I can get an update from the schools, whether they're implementing it for the this coming year. Um, but the transportation was just to provide transportation services to the vacation camps and the after school program. Um, where in the past they've had limited transportation available for those. Um, so it was to hopefully create more access to those uh, offerings. And then the subsidies was that there was, uh, there's a tuition or a cost for those vacation camps and to um, provide more um, basically free slots uh, for Amherst residents. Thank you. And do you know, does that also apply to summer? Just cause you mentioned February and April. And Yeah, I'll have to get an update that the original plan was just for the vacation camps, um, but I'll have to get an update where they are at currently. Okay, awesome. And I know um, this question was already asked about the Youth Empowerment Center, so I don't think I need more of an answer right this minute from um, Mr. Bothelman, but I, I would like to know more about how, like how the group is being established, how we're deciding who participates in that and what their actual charge would be. Like, what are we hoping to get from that? Um, and if there's a timeline. Um, so I'd be interested at another time to hear those things about the Youth Empowerment Center. Um, my other question, sorry, I was writing a whole bunch down when, when you were presenting. My other question was about measuring lasting impact. How are we measuring what is lasting impact? Like, what does that exactly mean? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I don't think, I think lasting impact, I think for us, it's, you know, sort of if it's going to continue to support the town or benefit the town years after the project is done. Um, the reason why I sort of pause for a second is that we do all of our projects, we do have goals and outcomes, tan, um, quantifiable goals and outcomes, um, which aren't necessarily focused at lasting impact, but just at impact in general. Um, so on that link in the PowerPoint, if anybody wants to see any of the, the goals that we did establish when these projects were first um, uh, created, uh, you'll see all those listed. And that's something that we'll continue to track and monitor. And if I can address uh, Alicia's Please. first question. So in terms of the what that the next step is for the Youth Empowerment Center, I would you would ex I will expect to have something to you prior to your July 17th meeting with a, with a proposal that what that looks like and get feedback from you at that moment in time. Awesome, thank you. I just have two more questions. Um, sure. uh, my next question was you mentioned Mr. Bachman something towards the end about I um the next round of funding identifying or using the funds to um address identified town needs. Um, and I'm wondering, like, do we have like a specific set of town needs that we were trying to address when we were um, distributing ARPA funds? Like, is that an actual thing that we did? In round one or in round two or both? Well, I, th I think now, I think you just said something yeah. about yes. like, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so in this round, we, when we were looking at what the needs were, we identified things that had to come up through the uh, joint capital planning process through some studies that is done either through uh, the, the uh, CARP program for sustainability issues, um, things like that. We looked at things that had already been studied, things that had been talked about by the council through the budget process, things that were in uh, my goals or in the, the uh, financial goals for the town. So we start to, that's, we we're, we're trying not to just make up things as we went along. We were trying to think about what are the things that have been already articulated as needs for the town that might not be uh, able to move forward, but for a sudden infusion of, of new money. Um, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, and I actually have two, two more. Um, no, and then also fine. in the distribution of monies for the assistance program, there was like a pie chart and it listed marginalized as an identity and i'm wondering what that means for the um small business grant program yeah there were two uh, charts the one on the 
left yeah, hand. Yeah, so, um, so we identified uh, marginalized as women-owned, uh, BIPOC-owned, or LGBTQ-owned. Um, there could be other um, categories in there, but those were the three primary that we identified. Okay, thank you. That is helpful. Um, and then my last question sort of just came up um, with the question about the bid monies being a separate contribution through the town as a like a recognized initiative of the town separate from business grants. And just wondering why some of the businesses wouldn't also be considered as contributing to the, the culture and arts sector. So the, the money for the, the Drake did not go through the bid. It went, it went directly to the Downtown Amherst Foundation, which is a nonprofit entity that's, that's operating the bid. Um, so when we identified a need and there was an initiative to create a, a downtown music and arts center, we thought it was important to support that effort. Uh, and generally, I think the community supported that. I mean, uh, Representative Dom came up with $50,000 to contribute to the, to the process project as well. So there's broad support in the community um, to create a, a venue that could support this that was um, owned and operated by a nonprofit entity. And if I could just add to that, just stepping back for a minute. So the, the process when we first allocated round one, um, we met with the finance committee, met with the council to talk about process. Um, and, you know, some communities did sort of a, a very open community grant process. Um, some did more targeted. Um, the feedback that we received from finance committee was to consult more with key stakeholders in town and, and see, get their thoughts. Um, so our process when we allocated round one um, was we, we did listening sessions that were open to everybody. Um, and there was feedback that I can recall specifically that, uh, that we received at those listening sessions that resulted in programs that have been created. So those were helpful. Um, we used Engage Amherst um, as our online tool to get feedback. Um, and then we consulted with key stakeholders in all of our departments, um, both staff, but also the, the community partners that they work with. Um, and those three sources, they, we, had a, um, we had a forum that they all filled out um, and we compiled all those and that helped create the basis of what we allocated for round one. <clears throat> thank Alicia. you. Uh, yes, thank you. I just have one last comment. Um, I ask because, and I have no issues myself with the bid, but my my question is then why, when we're looking at like expanding culture and helping disproportionately affected communities, which is literally what ARPA funds are for, why we wouldn't be looking at black owned businesses as a like specific target population since we <clears throat> literally have one in our downtown and that one business didn't get any ARPA funding. So that just is doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And so I think the next question or the, the other helpful process that it would be helpful to have outlined would be the application process. like what were the requirements or criteria of businesses to apply for ARPA funds? Because I know that we make those calls. Like the town can say ARPA funds can be used. We, we create the perimeters. And so what were the perimeters that we created that allowed that to happen? So you yeah. can put that all together and share that with everybody in the council. For yeah, and, I, and I'll just say- a really good, good question. Yeah. Yeah, and we didn't, again, we didn't have um, goals that specifically were laid out for black owned businesses, but we did have goals for BIPOC um, businesses and marginalized businesses. And even the funding for the Drake um, had goals um, for the performers and for the artists that they would bring in um, that had those, those parameters on it. Um, so again, we didn't have that uh, specific um, one, but we did have an equity lens that we brought to every project. Okay. Are there other councilor clarifying questions before we move to public comment? We will then come back to the council for additional discussion. All right, I, some other people have joined us in the room. I wanna make sure that if you would like to make public comment with regard to ARPA spending that you have signed in with Athena. She is over here. And I just wanna mention we now have 
about 11 or 12 people in the audience. And if you are in the Zoom uh, link and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand now. We're gonna get an assembly of how many people we have in each. Tina? Pat Ananabaku, you're first. Would you please come up to the microphone, state your name and address before you make your comment? We are limiting to three minutes per public comment. Thank you. Good evening. Can people hear me? We can. Okay, Pat Ananibako from Amherst, uh, president of Black Business Association of Amherst area. I'm here to speak on behalf of my group. I do have other BBA members here tonight. And listening, first of all, I wanna thank the town council and the town manager for tonight to discuss APA funds. Uh, at the same time, I am very embarrassed for our town to continue to discriminate against black owned businesses. I am calling for investigation of how Drake came to have $300,000 for a nightclub. And when a black owned business that is nightclub Hazel was declined, funding. The stakeholders that were being referenced tonight, to me, were all white-led organizations. BBAA has been in operation since 2016. When I hear that Pat Ananibako made up BBAA, look, look, look in the room tonight. We've invited um, our town manager and some elected and appointed officials to come to our meeting that I did not make this up. We were having this conversation tonight because of me, what my research, what I dug up, and that's why we're having this conversation. We have a huge crisis in our town. In listening to our town manager do his presentation, he never mentioned about the harm that was done to BBA members and other black owned businesses, BIPOC uh, businesses who did not receive APA funds. We were not invited to the table. And all of a sudden we've been told that Drake is special. What is special about Drake, except that it's owned by powerful landowners and developers in this town. And if we're serious about DEI, we need to uh, really be, we, need, we really need to do the work. Um, my group is asking for $150,000 for Hazel for, six, for eight months of permitting process delays due to racism. They were forced to put in permanent ramp and, Greg, and Drake was allowed to open with that permanent ramp. My group is also requesting $150,000 for APA funds. And that's nothing compared to Drake getting $300,000. I'm calling for investigation, how, how that came about. Why is Drake a priority in our town? Don't we have other groups that can also provide cultural and arts to our, uh, to our town? Ask any black owned business in our town if Drake opening has benefited them. Their revenue have not increased since Drake has opened. Who is Drake benefiting? We've had some black artists come up to us telling us that they were refused to perform at Drake. So this is just a crack, it's coming. It's going to blow up real big in our town. We better do the right thing and make everybody whole. We have Hispanic group, we have um, Asian uh, American group, 
other groups as well. I support nonprofit as well to tap into APA funds. We need to do a robust outreach in our community. What we're doing here to me is very measured, is very controlled. We need to have three or four hours and have people just come the, you know, for listening session. We need to go into the communities uh, and listen to them. What we're doing here is not enough. So we have more than $4 million on the table. Let's do the right thing. People are still hurting. People are still have a lot of debt. Uh, they haven't paid their bills, mortgage. You know, there are a lot of people hurting, childcare, and so on and so forth. Let's use the other $4 million well to people who really, really, really need it. When we talk about marginalized, it would be nice to really break it down by race. White women in our town, and I support them getting funding for businesses. I, they are not marginalized, except if they are group, you know, like LGBT or something like that, yes. So if we're talking about business uh, funding allocation, we need to break it down by race. I urge you to do your work, do your research, and try to piece out who got what with the business funding. I was able to get that information by myself by you know, uh, uh, working with the uh, finance director. I just have so much to talk about tonight, but three minutes isn't enough. What I'm trying to say is we need listening, we need public, robust public engagement to get this right. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I go on to the Zoom? Okay, Allegra, I believe it's Allegra Clark under Allegra Defund. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Allegra Clark. I live in District 2. Um, I am calling tonight about the ARPA funds. Um, I had two things. One, I support um, a more equitable distribution of funds for business owners and taking a more critical look at what has already been distributed. Um, one of the things I noticed when going through some of the numbers that were given was that when you look at the artists that are paid by the Drake, there was there seemed to be some discrepancies in the amount of payments given to black artists versus artists that were white. So that was something I noticed and I, I do appreciate that they are trying to bring a diverse group of artists into town but I think there needs to be equitable payment to those artists um, and to the existing black businesses in town. My other question comment was around the childcare subsidies that um, were taken back off the table because there wasn't an interest. And I just wonder how that was proposed. Um, what I have seen during and after the pandemic in my childcare facility and in speaking with friends is that there's been such staff turnover in childcare facilities that we actually have been operating at half the number of kids in slots at our place um, because they don't have staff staying long enough to be operating in ratio because the EEC has ratios of students to staff members and so so you know you would look in a room and say okay well 10 of 20 kids are here but really because there aren't enough staff consistently there they can't fill those other 10 slots so I I just don't know if staffing was going to be addressed by that um, money that was taken back off the table or if it was creating slots um, that might not necessarily need to be created but somehow need to be supported by staffing so that that was just a question critique comment uh, from my experience in child care in this pandemic that we've been in um, so those are my comments thank you thank you for joining us athena <clears throat> next we have vera cage please come up to the microphone state your name and address before you make your public comment
Vera Cage, 12 Long Meadow Drive, Amherst. Okay. So I have a problem and I think other people have problems and I think you all need to have a problem with the fact that our town manager sits on the board of the business improvement district. We should have a problem that our town hall, that city hall, that town hall, not only is just in close proximity physically with the business improvement district, but practically we're in bed with them. The fact that $300,000 went to the Downtown Amherst Foundation, which is a project, which is the nonprofit arm of the Business Improvement District, tells me that it didn't go $300,000 to put together to be the economic incubator, stimulator for this town, didn't go to the most qualified entity or human being to administer this project, this endeavor. There was no application process. There was no request for proposals. It went to the person sleeping next to them. That is not objective. The fact that we are so okay with this business as usual concept that our town council president, our town manager regularly meets with the executive director of the business improvement district, which is the lobbying group for developers and landowners in this community. The fact that $150,000 of the $300,000 that went to the Drake went to improve the facility of Barry Roberts is, is, is beyond my understanding or comprehension. He received $150,000 basically to do an upgrade to his building. $150,000 went to help tenants and homeowners who were behind on their rent, who were behind on their mortgage. And now we're thinking, oh, there's a need. So we'll, we'll kick in another $50,000 in the second round. That's $200,000. That's $100,000 less than what the Drake received. That's the communication. That's the reality. That is the real information that many of our people in this town will know more. When you push people to the wall, what do you expect them to do in this community? Sit back and take it? we will have a real revolution in our hands when we go to every door, every resident in this community and tell them that this is happening in our community. The $150,000 in programming that went to the Drake to put on programming, these are decisions and choices made by the same human beings. That's sickening and that has to stop. The fact that you can't find a driver for the Teen Empowerment Center is a fear because you know people who can drive this. You know people that can make this happen, that can make this a reality three weeks ago. But we in this room choose to ignore the people that we appoint to our advisory committee that we have worked with under the CSWG, the CSSJC, we can throw out a whole bunch of acronyms and alphabets. I'm over my time. I have more to say. I don't know if you will allow me, um, council president, because I'm also the board president of Amherst Media, which also is an entity, a nonprofit in this town that could benefit from ARPA funding that provides real critical resources to this town to document and to archive our history and the progress that we are achieving in this community. We work with college students providing internships. We equip regular community members with equipment, with training, with the tools to tell their own story. We're one of the oldest organizations in town. 
how can you not trust us, but trust people who have put together a concept that hasn't been tested? I'm just going to um, leave my comments at that. Um, I just say that we need to stop having the town manager serve on the business improvement district. It is a lobbying group. It is a 501c4. That's why they had to create a 501c3 nonprofit. It's the same people running the same show. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the um, Zoom and it's Kathleen Anderson. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. My name is Kathleen Anderson. I live in District 3. Um, I just wanted to remind uh, uh, Sean Mangano that BIPOC means Black, Indigenous, and people of color. In other words, people who own the um, uh, Hazel's Blue Lagoon are Black, business owners, they're black people. If this town can have a diversity, equity and inclusion committee, but cannot find a way to use ARPA funds and grant ARPA funds to black businesses in the community, there is something wrong <laughs> as Vera has pointed out there is something wrong. And if this town wants to advocate for a diversity, equity, and inclusion program, then it needs to honor the BIPOC people who have businesses and are eligible for ARPA funds. Throughout the history of the United States, white people have created ways for BIPOC people not to benefit from some of the same programs that they themselves benefit from. Let's stop that here. Stop it. I'll stop. Thank you for joining us. Athena. Alma Garshabaz, please come up to the microphone, state your name and address. Alma Garshabaz, 29 Chapel Road in Amherst. I uh, don't recall the specific recommended language about it, but I do serve on a town appointed um, committee and I just want to make clear I don't speak tonight in any capacity related to that committee. I speak only as myself, as a resident of the town. So just wanted to uh, um, express that first off. Um, I am part of uh, the Black Business Association of the Amherst area. I believe that um, the coming together, the organizing and the uh, expression of uh, a kind of united voice of Black business owners um, is very important to the um, long-term uh, viability of, of, uh, of those businesses. Um, we can see this back at the turn of the, uh, in the early 1900s, when Booker T. Washington organized similar um, kinds of Negro chambers of commerce and, and Black, helped to organize Black business uh, to come together all over the country in what historians refer to as the nadir, one of the worst periods in race relations and in high, high water mark of racism against black people in this country. It was very vital to, to their uh, development, to their communities, to their survival, to have that kind of uh, organizing. In fact, Booker T. Washington came to Amherst and went to uh, what today we call Hope Community Church as part of helping that church get off the ground and, um, and become financially viable. And at the same time, also promoting the black community in town, black businesses in town um, was all part of his, his coming here to Little Amherst. Um, 
I think we have to really look at black businesses as a strategic investment in the um, uh, viable viability and and long term development of this of the particular diverse community um, in Amherst of, of people of African descent. Uh, when I first came to the town, I remarked that I drove down the um, the street and there was Baku's African restaurant, and we immediately turned in to uh, to have lunch, and it was very impressive to me because where I was moving from, Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was also a restaurant owned and operated by Chef Chef Mundi, a uh, a Nigerian uh, chef that had his own business there in Tulsa, and so it it. It was very impressive to me to uh, to see that, oh, I'm moving somewhere that has the same uh, kinds of, of diversity. And um, when it closed, I was very sad and I began to push for, um, I found myself going out of town to Chicopee to where Hazel's was located at that time. And as I would go, I was like, well, why, you know, I'm making this trek from South Amherst over to Chicopee, what if they came here? And as I would talk to uh, Junior Williams and Patrick Chapman, I saw that in terms of where they were in their own business development and their own ideas, the idea of moving to, to Amherst was very appealing. And so I was directly a part of, of the encouragement of that. And so to see how they have fared in this town is a source of a really great, great, great pain to me. And I hope something will be done uh, for that particular business, but but also that uh, the town will make a strategic investment in supporting Black businesses. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I have one uh, person in on Zoom. This is specific comment to the ARPA funds. Uh, Darcy Dumont, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, this is Darcy Dumont. I'm I live in South Amherst, and I I just wanted to um, support the previous speakers in their um, in their expression uh, that they felt that there has been unequal or inequitable distribution of the ARPA funds, um, and that it makes a whole lot of sense to make sure that some of the funds go for specifically for black owned businesses. Um, and that I really hope that the town council is listening to the distress that's being expressed here tonight. Um, I also wanted to just um, say that I was pleased to hear that the, um, that the high school, uh, might be getting solar canopies. <laughs> I'm really excited about that possibility. I, you know, the the initial request for that was um, two or three years ago. And uh, one thing I'd be interested in finding out is if it would include, um, I know that we're also applying for EV buses. Um, it could conceivably be a really uh, exciting program of uh, creating a microgrid around the the school community there, which would be also be pro provided with energy storage by the EV school bus batteries. And I know that was part of the initial application by the high school students. So would be really interested to hear about whether that is being contemplated and also whether uh, it's being contemplated that it be integrated into the community choice aggregation um, uh, assets. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Athena. Monica Cage, please come up to the microphone, state your name and address and, and then make your comment, please. Hi, my name is Monica Cage. I reside at 12 Long Meadow Drive in Amherst, and I'll yield my comment to Vera Cage. Thank you.
a VR cage, 12 long metal drive. Amherst. Um, So I hope that the town council will take action on my advisement that the town manager should step down from his membership with the business improvement district. Because it seems like everything that the bid wants, the bid gets, and that doesn't sit comfortably with a lot of us in this town. Not everyone can speak up against wealthy landowners in this town, right? A lot of us want to choose to be in proximity with, the, with these wealthy white landowners and developers because maybe they can do more for us. But a lot of us in this community disagree. A lot of us in this community are suffering economically, financially. We heard that our children are suffering in school. We could use more help and more support. And the data is there, the research there, the engagement's there. It's just figuring out what we think is cool and it could be a priority. And, and the litmus test shouldn't be how many other powerful people agree with these projects. Because sometimes we need to listen and provide the adequate support for communities who are truly suffering and not give money that are meant to target communities who and, and businesses who are suffering economically. Like ARPA is supposed to help people who are struggling not for people that are well off. So this is not a game, right? A lot of people, a lot of people in this town, the elites, it's a game. How much can we get? And who cares if people are suffering, if you're behind on your rent, if you're behind on your mortgage, your taxes, who cares? We're in this elite club and we're going to run the show. We're going to get the money and we're going to spend it on ourselves. You'll get some, you'll get some, you'll get some, you'll get some. Don't worry. We will put our people to work and we will gain from the money that's coming down the pipeline, whether it's opera or anything else. So this is not a game for many of us. This is life and death. This is our, our livelihood. This is our pride. This is our joy. This is our life. And when you have signs all over the town that says Black Lives Matter, really, in this town, there shouldn't be one sign up. Because how you all have made decisions, Black lives do not matter in this town. Thank you. There are no more people on the Zoom. Are there others there? Steve Nagy, <clears throat> please come up to the microphone, state your name and address before you make your comment. Good evening. My name is Steve Nagy, uh, 106 T. Waddle Hill Road, Leverett, Massachusetts. Um, I was here this evening to learn more about how the ARPA funds were being distributed. And it was very interesting to find that uh, the Drake, uh, was received $300,000, and I believe half of that was allocated to um, building improvements. Uh, it seems odd that American Rescue Act funds would be going toward an HVAC system for a landlord uh, that had a vacant building, and now I believe that vacant building has the Drake as a tenant. I'd love to know how much the lease payment is on a monthly basis, and also that they will be housing another uh, new business here in town. 
the White Lion Brewery. So I will find more information as time goes on. Certainly the Form 990 from the organization that is the nonprofit that received the funding uh, will be available as time goes on. And we'll continue to do some research and see exactly where these funds have gone. Thank you. Athena, is there anyone else? Okay, that concludes public comment. We will now return to council to provide feedback or other questions that you might have regarding the expenditures of ARPA funds, both past and in the future. Uh, Anna. Thank you. Paul, could you please discuss and outline the public engagement process for the distribution of ARPA funds in the first round? What did you do to engage the community? What process was there and what feedback did you hear uh, as part of that process? Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Shine can jump in on this as well. The, you know, we, we did have a number of meetings with, with, that were open to the public. We had people able to weigh in on the Engage Amherst website. Um, yeah, I think um, I can hop in. It's yeah. probably something if I, we put together a full written response, um, I can, again, we did a, a listening sessions. We reached out to these stakeholders. We did um, consulted with the council and the finance committee and we had the engage Amherst process, but um, in order to give you all the sort of findings or outcomes of those public engagement sessions, it's better if I summarize it. Um, but again, we used a template that we work, used with every stakeholder um, to summarize the feedback um, that came back from them. So I can pull that all together pretty easily for you. If it's easy to pull together, I'd be interested to see um, specifically also how many listening sessions did you have mm -hmm. and were they well attended, uh, things like that. You don't need to have the sure. answer now, but I would love to know if it's relatively simple to pull together. Mm -hmm. I have a couple other questions, but I'll, I'll let other people go first. We'll add, we'll add that to the list for the July 17th meeting. Pam Bruni. Thank you. Um, in the second round, if I'm to reach out to folks in District 4 to alert them of the opportunities, is there some kind of structure or format that you are seeking this input? You listed, it was listed about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different categories, everything from public health to economic development. Are those the same categories that are expected to um, sort of lump things into for the round number two? Is okay if I respond to that, Paul. Sure. Um, so I think we're looking for feedback specifically on the projects that were proposed. Um, again, if there's support for those projects, if there's not, um, or if you're hearing alternative ideas, we would like that feedback as well. So in addition to ideas within those categories, also, what is their what are their thoughts on the the six or so projects that were already suggested? Yeah, I mean, really, there's. There's four that are being proposed. Four. There's the, the solar, solar canopy at the high school. Senior kitchen, yep. community grants, and roads and sidewalks. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Those are the four. And then there are already the commitments that have been made. Uh, Pat. Just a quick question. Can you define or clarify what's meant by stakeholder? I have an idea, but I'd like to hear. What yeah. So, um, um, again, I can give you a list. I, I think we summarized somewhere um, each of the groups. Um, but for example, public health um, was working with the Board of Health, for example, would be one of the stakeholder groups. Um, uh, the school uh, the school community and the school district. Um, so sort of every area or every department head has their sort of key stakeholder group that they partner with. Um, but again, in the response to Anna's question, we can list all the stakeholders that were consulted. Okay, so basically it was town departments? It was town departments and their community partners that they work with. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Dorothy. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, those who have get more. Um, Big business establishments basically run lots of places in small towns as well as big because it's easier, it's efficient. Uh, it's so much easier to deal with people who are part of your regular group. Um, 
And that is the way business has been done and is done in most places in America, because it's easy for those who have power. But um, one of the woman who headed the senior center a while ago, she kept asking, who's not at the table? And um, you know, for me, I'll tell you, if you reach out to me on Engage Amherst, you have not reached out to me. Um, that's a new way that some people like, but that's you know, there are other ways. Um, the problem is that there is this great appearance of impropriety, and I am not saying there is an impropriety, all right, but there is a conflict of interest, and I understand that the desire was to reduce costs. We do not have uh, an official, formal economic development officer. And so it seemed reasonable to our workaholic town manager to take on that role. And it was efficient. And I understand that. Um, but I, I see the wrong that has happened here. I do not want to see us to continue to harden signs um, where we just get more and more alienated. Um, when I came to Amherst, I assumed that I wouldn't have to pick sides, um, that this was a um, modern, up-to-date liberal town. And right now what's happening, it is, that is not what I'm seeing. So um, what has happened now because of the um, uh, backlash of the black owned business that felt that it did not receive its due. And I've got to say that a lot of very reasonable points have been raised tonight. Um, there is now, the Drake is now requesting a variance for the fact that it does not have a permanent handicap ramp. And it just has a temporary one that gets stored underneath the, the stage. But they have been operating for a whole year without it. And they will continue to operate you know, for another year while that whole process is being solved. And the other business, and I, and I know that the bid did in fact reach out and help. Uh, they did not necessarily ignore the other group, but the other group did not get money. And so, I think that I have to always be suspicious when I, things like this. I don't think that people have to intentionally do things in order to hurt somebody else, but um, you know, giving the money to one of the biggest landowners in town for his building, okay, and he's very gracious and has lent lots of things still, that doesn't look good, folks. Um, and we just have to remember the world we live in where so many things that seem normal and okay, we realize now are not normal, they're not okay. I mean, only this year I learned that the GI Bill and the, and the FHA housing program were not available to most black people. I didn't know that. I grew up thinking I was living in a democratic fair country where uh, there were openings uh, for people uh, of, of different levels and different races. So you know, there are centuries of racism in this country. I am not saying that the bid or our town manager has been racist, but I am saying that there has been something which certainly has an appearance of impropriety and that it maybe have been well-meaning, um, but it did not work out this way. So I'm, I'm really hoping that we don't have to continue to harden our sides, but that we can come together, work together and do something to bring and help this new business, this black owned business uh, into successful operation in our town. Um, you know, there's a difference between a business that hires blacks and a business which is owned by blacks. They, they, it's not, you know, day and night, but this is a black owned business and it needs, it may have been given help, it needed more help and it did not get any funds. So I'm hoping very much that we can come to some kind of, of settlement, understanding and um, stop this creation of this feeling that there's something wrong has happened. Amherst does not need this. The papers lately in this area of, of towns just falling apart, blowing themselves up, um, it is uh, getting to be ridiculous. I don't want our town to join it in, in, in more than one way. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to ask that you start using the clock. Thank you. Jennifer. Uh, yes, I was just wondering when to add to the questions that were, we'll come back at July 17th with the response to is what was the process? It was during COVID, you know, what was the process by which all the businesses in town, or was there a process, what was the process of notifying businesses that the ARPA funds were available to apply for? So might not have included, you know, so that's my question. And then I guess how, so that was, the bid was selected to handle the applications 
for the ARPA funds to businesses? Am I correct in understanding that? The bid uh, was selected to administer the grant program. Okay, so what, so my, I guess my questions are, was it to administer it to businesses all in Amherst, mm -hmm. just within the city, not just to downtown businesses? Yep. Okay. Yeah, the, so the, what, there were businesses beyond downtown that received yeah. grants. But I wanna know how that, the availability of those sure. funds and the, the process notification. of applying what that yeah. was. Yeah, yep. thank that. you. That'll be part of what we answer, right. what you'll answer for July 17th. Thank exactly, you. thank you. Anna? Uh, I have another question and then I have a statement uh, after, I'll wait for that one. Um, did Amherst Media apply for ARPA funding? Was that something, and when we think about the health of a community, um, which is the purpose of ARPA, ARPA funding in the largest sense, um, I'm curious if that was um, an area that was able to, to receive funding, if, if there was an application and from them and we were able to support them? So there wasn't a category, uh, they did not. The answer is, did they apply? No, they did not. They have subsequently expressed interest in ARPA funds. Um, and that's one of the reasons we established the community uh, grant sort of section to recognize that there were, there were some organizations, nonprofits that didn't have access previously. Thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you. I have a few comments. Um, one, I'm actually glad that the monies that was allocated for the move of the sixth grade to the middle school didn't get used because I think that that's a strange way to utilize ARPA funding. And considering the current crisis in terms of social emotional well-being that exists within our schools right now i mean like you can talk to any staff in the school in any school there is a crisis why we would not allocate the monies to something else for our students that would actually help to combat the impacts that they are experiencing from covid we are cutting teachers we are cutting programs we are not fully paying our paras and when we have extra monies to combat the impacts of COVID in our community, we're gonna fund the move of the sixth grade to the middle school. That is strange. So I'm very glad that that did not happen. And I'm hoping that we can find a way to use that money to help our students who need resources and who are lacking fully compensated caregivers during the day. Um, so I would definitely urge you to think about that. Um, the, one of the other, um, future initiatives was the community grants. Um, and again, while that is, has been a beneficial program to many, a lot of people have not been able to access that program because of the requirements. So like you need to have an eviction notice. You need to have a notice to quit. You need to have all of these things. You need to have a shut off bill. So you cannot just simply be behind. You also cannot say I cannot pay um, because living in poverty is not that cut and dry. It's not, I just miss my rent. Like maybe I had to take my money for my electric bill and my gas bill and my car bill to pay my rent because I don't want to lose my house, but now I didn't pay my other bills and there's no funding for that. So I think we need to think about the requirements that we're putting on the monies for the people who are who are receiving the community grants, because there is a lot of very strict requirements as to who and how people can receive that money. And so if we're going to allocate more funding to that program, I beg of you to revisit the requirements and how people can apply for that funding without bucket loads of documentation. People should be able to just write simply like COVID impact statements. That should be enough. Um, and then I did want to talk a little bit more about, sorry, I know I'm running out of time, about um, Hazel's not getting money because that is so very troublesome for me. And for all of the reasons that were already mentioned, um, but one thing that I think people are not also realizing is not only did they not get money, but when we're talking about the ramp issue, they were not allowed to open at all. They were not allowed to function as a business because of this ramp for many, many months. 
that is delayed income, that is setbacks, that in itself is a debt that all happened during COVID. Why are we not compensating them for that? If we're allowing other businesses to currently run, operate, generate income and revenue for themselves, why are we not compensating for them for that amount of time that we did not allow them to open? That is a whole separate issue, but then they also didn't get ARPA funds. The, it just makes no sense. And so my big hope is that when we're looking back at the monies that was allocated and not spent, let's not just roll it over into the next round where we have a new pot of money. Can we look backwards for a minute and look at all the people who didn't get money during the first round who should have gotten money? Because there's money left over. Can we reopen again the businesses grant and change those requirements as well? Because I think the requirements are too borrowing. Why would, the, why would there be a requirement that if you have an outstanding bill, you can't apply for ARPA funding? Isn't, isn't that what it's for? This makes no sense. We need to revisit the requirements because this is a systemic issue. This is literally how systemic racism happens because it's not within the people, it's within the systems. We set it up to happen like this. We need to look at this. This is a very serious issue. And when we talk about dismantling systemic racism, this is a system right here that we've created that we can readdress if we really are serious about dismantling systemic racism. We change the policies, we change the practice, we change our approach. We listen to the peoples in our communities. We have heard enough people. This is an issue. People are suffering. We need to change our practices and our policies. And we can do that. We still have ARPA money left. Pam. I appreciate everything that Councillor Walker just said. Um, I'm also looking back and asking about the transportation to summer programs. Can money be found? I think we, we got a message from someone in the community reminding us that um, it's one thing to have a summer program, but if you can't get to it, it does you no good. So I would also ask to, to reopen any opportunities for folks to apply for the transportation, transportation and to summer programs themselves as part of reassessing essentially what, what wasn't quite covered in round one or has carried over into round two. Thank you. Can I speak to that one real quick, Lynn? Please. Um, I, one thing I forgot to mention, and I think um, Councillor Walker mentioned this as well, um, Within the money given to the schools, I don't think there's going to be any capacity to do transportation for summer. Um, but the other bucket that we have talked about that is the recreation money that, that was given to the recreation department to um, improve access. So that is a bucket of funds that we um, we have actually discussed transportation in the past, and um, this feedback is helpful. And the recreation funds are from the town, not yep. from the school pot. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Anika. Thank you. So I just had a couple of questions, um, and, and these can be for the second round. One was that I don't know if it is possible, but it, are any of these, would any of um, the funds be available for other the middle or high school roof with all the trouble they're having? I'm sorry, um, I didn't hear that, Anika. Uh, so both the middle school and the high school roofs are leaking. Um, so I didn't know if any of this would be able to be of help there. Okay. Um, and then I like what I heard about the senior center, and I wasn't sure if um, some of those upgrades included railings or emergency poles for the bathrooms. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, the roads and sidewalks. Um, I hope that um, folks are will be happy about that, whatever is available. Um, but I did also want to speak um, in regards to the bid, the Drake, and the BBAAA. Um, one, I just wanted to note out there that there is more than one Black business in town. Um, and, you know, there were us in, in downtown area. We don't want to leave people out. And um, in terms of the businesses who that did receive the black businesses that did receive funding. I'm happy to see we have at least one that I know here. I wanna give a 
Shout out to Carefree Cakery. So excited that you're opening in July. So ready for you. And I know many of us are already familiar. And I just wanted to add and ask really that with these community grants could, and with the next discussion, can we have a thorough, clear explanation of qualifications for the ARPA funds and what had, what had to be done, what were held to federally? Um, because as we all know, um, during the pandemic, there were so many who have lost their businesses and where it is not easy for anyone, certainly for Black, for the Indigenous, for other people of color, for women, for LGBTQ, no matter what anyone tells you out there, it is incredibly difficult. Um, I'm someone who experienced that firsthand and still does. I mean, this happened after 9-11. What also was a fall through is we have to also understand that with the rev uh, revolution that you're referring to, that also comes with the opening of books. So we want to make sure that all of um, our businesses, that we're actually setting people up for success or sustainable long-term success. And I would just also like to add, I think I'm over my time here, close to it, that you know, for our younger entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs, please do not wait for anyone to tell you to get a proposal or a plan. Be ready, be ready, do not wait. Disasters can happen anytime, but please have yourself educated because no one comes to you. It would be nice. And we may able to be able to create some of that bubble here in Amherst, but in the real world, you have to do the work. And especially being a black business, you need to make sure your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed double time. So I hope that there will be a strong educational component. And I would also like to um, thank Gabrielle Gould, especially in the, the bid for your work for being out there every day during the pandemic. Thank you. Anna? So my understanding was that when the prior council looked at the long ranging plan for staffing, they chose to fund the, the DEI department and I, I was not on that council. Personally, I agree with that decision, uh, knowing that it meant we wouldn't be having an economic development director for a while. Uh, I looked up the articles of organizations for other business improvement districts across the state, as well as the official guiding documents for from mass development. And they all include the practice of having a town representative, either a mayor or a mayor's appointee or a town manager on their board. So I, I get, for me, I'm I'm not, that doesn't feel like a bad idea, given the nature of and the relationship of business and municipalities. Um, we are at a 3% or 4% vacancy rate downtown, and we don't have an economic development director. Those two things don't just happen, right? Those are not a coincidence. That is a result of serious intervention and, and work from the bid and the chamber and from our local businesses to sustain. Um, and that's pretty incredible. I mean, I, I look at surrounding towns after COVID and, and we're doing very well. And I recognize that there's a lot we can still do better and a lot of systems that we need to disrupt. So we've heard a lot from the administrator of these grants through the bid prior to tonight um, on why specific businesses did or did not receive funding. And I, I do want to separate out the ramp issue because I feel like we've got 60 some odd pages of a report from our DEI director on that. Um, but I want to focus in on the requirements. So Paul, I guess this is my, my question that I'm not expecting right now, Paul and Sean, and I think Anika just asked something very similar. So I apologize if it's repetitive. You, and it's building on Alicia's comment too. You said that you were expecting an audit, a federal audit at some point on ARPA funds. Um, and I'm curious what you anticipate being required in that audit, because I if it's if the case was that the administer administrator of these grants was able to just willy nilly make up requirements, then that is I have many questions about that and how those were selected. However, I am assuming that with federal funding, as with state funding, as with town funding, we see a lot of requirements that you have to report back on. And so I'd like to know what those requirements might be. Um, in terms of the questions, I see that I see the yellow light. I'm paying attention. Uh, so in terms of the questions that you had asked in your presentation, I am really excited about the possible round two uh, projects, specifically the community grants and the solar canopy. Um, and I am really excited to see that you're looking at JCPC as a source for uh, ideas, especially the resident capital 
requests, I ask that you consider those as well. Um, we see small asks come from our community and often they're challenging to meet. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Good timing, Anna. Anika. I'm sorry, Andy. So <clears throat> to follow up on what uh, Anna said, I just uh, been thinking about this for a while. Uh, we have to face a reality in Amherst and the reality is that uh, we have a tremendous amount of land that we can't tax. And that's either because it's conservation land um, or a lot of it is owned by nonprofit colleges and other institutions and the University of Massachusetts, um, which uh, all um, contribute to the demand for town services or a substantial amount of them contribute to the demand for town services but we're not getting any revenue for it. Um, and as a consequence, Amherst has one of the highest residential tax rates of um, communities in Massachusetts. And the, uh, um, anything that we can do with ARP funds or any other grant opportunities that will allow us to do anything that will change the balance so that there's a little bit more money coming from non-residential uh, taxpayers and can increase the amount that is coming from business taxpayers is going to, in the end, have a long-term effect. And uh, during the pandemic, some of those consequences and funding disparity um, as far as uh, the revenue funding disparity um, actually was uh, worsened, which is one of the reasons that Congress passed ARPA was to allow that balance to be um, addressed and to recognize the, the effect of, uh, on, on, on the business sector, which is uh, in Amherst, when you start looking over at Northampton and driving around Northampton or some of our other communities, Hadley, um, we see a tremendous difference in the balance of tax revenue that's available from commercial versus taxpayer that's available from residential. So um, as we're looking for criteria to measure um, round two um, expenditures, looking at whether those expenditures will contribute to the goal of trying to help recognize the burden on taxpayers that are residential taxpayers, I think is something that um, I would recommend for consideration. Thank you. Are there any other councilor comments at this time? Alicia. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that I think we do a lot of consideration, and I know this is part of our job as counselors and town manager and the finance director, but thinking about our town's economic development and what benefits our town, but we're really, really missing out on community members. Like, I don't think we take into consideration the businesses and the things that don't directly benefit us. We're talking about what can increase the revenues that come to us so that we have more money for our budgets. And like, that is great. And we need to help the people in our community. It doesn't always have to be a direct benefit to our revenue. Because expanding the culture downtown, expanding what's available for people, making it more inclusive, making it more open, making there more diversity, more possibilities, more things happening, also inadvertently benefits our town and our revenues. People will want to come here. People will feel more comfortable here. And there was a comment made earlier, um, just thinking about the differences in communities when you say our community and our priorities. I think just like recognizing and understanding that there is a real difference in priorities between different racially identifying communities. Like that is just a real thing and it doesn't need to be a bad thing. It's just real. And so when we're addressing our priorities, whose priorities are we addressing and whose priorities are we completely ignoring and missing out on? 
And I think we need to find a way better way of balancing because the scale is very heavily tipped in favor of financially financially well off and non BIPOC peoples. It's very, very much tipped in favor of those populations and those communities and what they like to do and what they want to see in our town. But like a lot of people are really also very much excited to have black food in our community. Like that is also very exciting. That is also an economic driving force for our community. Like, I think we just need to look at these things in the same way instead of so differently. I just see like a huge divide in how we're talking about and thinking of like all of the really good things we're saying about the Drake. You can say those same exact things about Hazel's. Like, I just, I just don't understand this huge divide. We need to accommodate our whole entire community. We need to pour funds into our whole entire community. And some of our community is suffering more. We need to address those things. Are there any other counselor comments? We're going to conclude this section of the meeting. We're going to take a 10 minute break. We will be back at 8.45. Thank you. Please make sure you unmute or mute. I'm sorry, mute yourself. Thank you. Who did the uh, poster? Remember the history by the Nika, it was some of your ancestors that led to the creation of the Hope community. Yeah, and the <laughs> English, right? And they um they were meeting for church services here in town hall until they got the new building that they used. Like yeah. In nineteen oh four is when I see that Washington. Yeah. 1904, he helped to raise money. What is it? Like, is it brown like the medical people? No, I've been going back and forth to the hospital. I'm going to go Do you know when it's going to be 
All right, folks, 
it's time to start getting ready to reconvene. When you return, please turn on your video. How do you feel about the way you know, stuff? Yeah. Like, no. no, as you go, it'll be one day. Fine, it is. That will change. It'll be fine. Yeah. 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 But no, I can't. Who's here? Dr. Selman is coming in for half an hour. I'm just waiting until we're done. I'm going to take it. Okay. All right. Until we're done with whatever we're working on. All right, when you return, please turn on your video. Hi, Dorothy. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in. All right, we are going to continue. Um, I am making a couple adjustments to the agenda. Uh, at this point, I am postponing the streetlight policy until the 17th of July. I am keeping the others, although if there, we start to get into major discussion about items four through seven, I may postpone some of those as well. So at this point, we're going to go to counselor compensation, okay? I'm going to begin council compensation by reading the motion, looking for a second, and then asking the finance committee chair, Andy Steinberg, to report, and we'll proceed from there. Um, in accordance with charter section 2.4, to adopt an increase to town council compensation in the amount of $2,500, for a total compensation of $7,500 for town council members, an increase of 2,000 for the council president for a total of 9,500. That does not read the way it's supposed to. Effective January 2nd, 2024, and to request the town manager submit a supplemental budget appropriation to meet said increase in accordance with charter section 5.6. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Andy, would you like to speak to the town finance committee's discussion? I think I'm going to be very brief because the report was an attempt to be, com uh, to be complete. Uh, it was uh, um, a divided discussion, um, but we really ended up focusing on the item that is the subject of the motion that was just made and seconded, which is the amount of increase in compensation. Other aspects um, were uh, not recommended for immediate action for, uh, by agreement actually with uh, pretty much everybody who's involved in the process, uh, not moving forward with questions about health insurance, which had a no number of complications, including the fact that if we did it for one elected board, we'd have to do it for all elected boards. Um, and that that was a legal uh, requirement that created an economic uh, barrier and a practicality barrier. Um, and the uh, question of uh, compensation for family care, we felt very strongly that that's something that we felt was an important um, component. Um, the plan that was put forward by the town manager even before processes was part of the budget, um, it has that in uh, the budget. We would like to see that go forward as quickly as uh, possible. And uh, 
because it, um, once July 1st comes, is the funds are available. Um, our suggestion, which is not part of the motion because we didn't think it needed to be a part of the motion, is that there be quarterly reports um, on how those funds are being expended and used. Um, and we did recognize that there was one um, problem that um, exists that there's no real resolution to, which is that um, the uh, money can only be spent by reimbursement, um, that there can't be any advance um, on it because of uh, how the, the law works. So those are the, the major points. Um, I think that there was one thing that was omitted from the report, um, and uh, I uh, will um, hope that Kathy Shane will pick up on this if she wishes, but I'm gonna just report it quickly, and that is that we did research several other communities that were not on the list that the co-sponsors had put forward as far as uh, providing what the comps is uh, compensation to counselors is, and um, the um, East Long Meadow is fairly much in line with us, but we found that Greenfield is two thousand dollars a year, and uh, so that um, that was um, information that only came to us um, actually uh, at the very end, and uh, um, I. Uh, Wish that it had been a little, uh, um, a little bit more clear to the committee earlier, uh, but I'll let Kathy pick up on that if she wishes. So that's basically the report. We, uh, as I say, did make the recommendation and uh, did have a vigorous discussion that we tried to report on very fairly on both um, people who are arguing for a larger amount and uh, people who are arguing for the amount that was ultimately voted. So um, other than that, we'll just respond to questions. Are there questions from the council? Mandy Jo. So my, my question deals with the supplemental budget appropriation part of this motion. Um, and it's really the part I'm struggling with more than other parts. Um, mm -hmm. Last year's budget that is in operation right now for a couple more days, the school committee had asked us for more funds and we said, find the funds within the budget. We think it's possible. Um, this year, they passed a budget that was above what we got. I don't think we ever received a formal request for it, but I think... We again basically said find the funds within the budget. Uh, but this part of the motion seems to say give us more money outside of our 2% or 2.5%, 3% that we gave this year so that we can find the funds to pay ourselves. And that doesn't sit well with me. So I guess my question to the manager or to the finance committee and then to the manager is to the finance committee, why aren't we just asking the manager to find the funds within the budget we first, we already passed and to the manager, uh, do you have any idea where you would find the funds if we if we passed a motion that said submit a supplemental budget? Paul, let's start with you and then sure. yeah. What I would suggest is that the council, if it chooses to increase the uh, compensation for the counselors, then ask the count the manager for a, a suggest recommendations for funding it versus saying come with a new appropriation or determining what that decision how to fund it would come back. So we may come back to you with different options in terms of how this would be funded. One might be an appropriation, one might be existing sources, one might be a timing, when does it go into effect? So I would think you would ask the manager instead of, it does, I worry about the precedent it sets in terms of the council saying, please introduce a new appropriation for this in particular. But I think you know the, the timing of the, when the council wants it to take effect versus when our budget year is, is sort of like, out of sync and that's the challenge we have. But I think the suggestion would be, we want, we want to increase appropriation. We want to increase our, the compensation, which is within the town, which in the council's responsibility. And then to the manager say, you know, how, what is your recommendation to bring back something that tells us how we can do this? That's what my suggestion would be. 
Mandy Joe, with that suggestion, do you have an amendment you'd like to make to the motion? Um, eventually, but I have to come up with the wording. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to go on to Pam Rooney. Since I don't have the all the documents and the very thorough uh, finance report in front of me, can I be reminded, please, if this vote would be for town council plus school board plus library trustees? Is that all part of the package? This vote is only for the town council. The uh, thing that was discussed at the finance committee is that we also would like the finance committee to provide to the council a letter that would be signed that would go to the um, charter review commission that might suggest that they come up with a way to form some kind of uh, committee of non-elected officials to look at this in a way similar to Northampton. And at that point, or possibly even before, to look at both school committee. At this point, Jones Library does not receive any compensation. And the charter actually, um, we, we spent a lot of time on the charter. Andy, you might want to add to what I've just said. Yeah, um, to, to both comments, I mean, I can be interested in what Mandy proposes because uh, we really were going back to the charter and she was in the charter commission. So she might help us to understand what the charter commission was intending the, to, for the process here. But um, the section that is particularly um, directed towards the council, um, which is uh, separate from the section for other um, boards and committees, which is why the school committee and library are in a different status, says that uh, within the first 18 months the, of a council being seated, that the council can propose an increase or decrease, actually, it goes for either way, uh, to be effective for the next council term. And then it also uses the words subject to appropriation. Well, uh, the town manager, when developing a budget, which he started that work on that in January and February, um, had no reason to know that we would be thinking about an increase in compensation so that um, there was no possibility, uh, no expectation reasonably to build it into the uh, budget that starts uh, on July 1st. And the only way to get it into, um, to do anything for that next fiscal year uh, that is FY24 is to do an amendment to the budget. And the only process for, the, for an amendment to the budget is um, what has been suggested there. The council can't amend the budget. The budget amendment has to come um, yeah. on a recommendation from the town manager. Mm -hmm. So when you put all of those sections of the charter together, this is the only way that it could happen now with the uh, for the uh, for this council to act for the next council term is to do what is proposed. So that's why uh, we took the choice that we did as far as process is concerned, and uh, which then gets back to the uh, school committee and library trustees are under a very different section, and it's why I, um, when we did the report. We pointed out the fact that all the charter sections are very explicitly set forth in a separate document within the council uh, within the committee packet that is available on a click from the uh, finance committee report because the uh, amendment does not have to be made by July second. It could be made at any time for the school committee because it's an amendment to an existing. Comp uh, compensation and uh, so there's a separate process for that for the library trustees it would have to wait until the next budget okay. Mandy Joe, you have your hand up is that because you have a suggested 
I do, but I can wait. Okay. Uh, Dorothy. Okay. Um, town councilors are democratically elected in order to represent the whole body of the town. And if we are to stop being a group of the quote unquote elite who know better and want to make decisions for other people, we have to make it possible for a broader cross section of people to afford to do this job, which everyone knows is a very time consuming job. And um, we, the council is deeply enriched by the presence of, of one mother of school age kids on the council. There's a reason there aren't others. And it has a lot of it has to do with compensation. I feel that I've been played a game of bait and switch. Uh, we were we brought this up at the very beginning. This was Darcy brought up the question of counselor compensation last uh, counselor, and we were told, "Oh, it's too late to do it." Okay, I've been bringing this up again and again and again. If we need a commission to study rates, then we should have had that commission from the very beginning of this council. So I, I feel totally that I've been played with. Um, being told, oh, we'll do it, we'll do it well. Then we get to the point and it's too late to have a commission and we can't do it without a commission. I think it's very simple to do the original proposal that was brought in, which is $10,000 a year for elected town councilors. I don't see anything challenging or difficult about that. Um, and it will make it possible, particularly since we have the reimbursement uh, requirement, which is you know one of those things that are part of, of uh, town budgeting things uh, that are out of our control that you have to lay the money out first. Um, having been a very uh, a mother of three kids without much money, I know how difficult that would be. So, and ten thousand dollars isn't a lot of money, but it is a lot different than five. I I just feel that we 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 have these conversations, and I don't feel they go anywhere because very few people seem to understand there are a lot of things at stake, and one of them is democracy. So I would say, let us support the $10,000 a year salary for counselors for the next incoming council. Thank you. Dorothy, if you want to change the amount, you need to forward it as a amendment to the motion. I'm gonna go on to Kathy, but that's how we have to deal with this at this point. Kathy. Uh, thank you. Um, I just have a couple quick comments. Um, it's in the context of us uh, just going through a very difficult period with um, trying to settle contracts and not finding extra money then that the schools asked for that we split the difference and went instead of to 10,000, we went halfway there. And it's a very real perception of who do we represent that we we shouldn't be taking care of ourselves alone. We should be financially accountable. The going to the full amount is the equivalent of and and Andy wrote this. I mean, he did a, a good job writing up our discussion. But we're talking. It's a firefighter. It's a school teacher. It's it's not an insignificant amount. And it's because we're thirteen counselors. Um, so when we look at some of these other towns, they have eight. They have nine. And when you look at the whole table, Andy just wanted me to reemphasize what he already said. It's not I need that to pause the meeting a minute. I have lost my screen. Okay. Um, okay, I got it set my clock. Oh. Are you okay? Uh, hold on. I'm rebooting. Maybe he did. Uh, Lynn, you're still, can we continue? I'm sorry. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I just needed to make a point that I'm not up there, um, but we will continue. So uh, at this point, uh, Kathy, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I was just gonna say that, you know, that, that we were, we were very conscious of the context that we were in, and we thought this is a beginning step. It's not the end. Um, so it's not that we would hold the whole process to a study. Um, I think we all would like to have some more uh, annual increases, um, something in line with what the union contracts are coming in with. And then the other point, Andy said, said it in reference, we were given a table that showed what towns in the surrounding area that have counselors in and if you add a couple more towns that weren't in that table it's not that we're at the very bottom 
you know, so there are towns that are above us, um, but we're not at the very bottom. That's not to say that any number is particularly correct, but I think um, given the extremely tight budget and the very tough negotiations, plus when the schools asked for $85,000 more, um, we said no, that I could not bring myself to go into the higher amount. I think this is a, a reasonable first step. So I just want to make that comment on how we came up with the going to the increase of 2,500 rather than going all the way up to 10 which would, I know we shouldn't do it by percentage, but the other would have been doubling our salaries, our stipends. We all agree they're stipends, not salaries. And I'll stop. Thank you. Um, Anna, would you please take over the meeting while my Zoom updates? Yep, Alicia, you. you are next. Go ahead. Oops. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say a couple things. I'm, I'm sure you all have read what was in the packet, but just because it wasn't explicitly stated, even though Andy did do a good job at giving a, a summary of our conversation that the original motion uh, was proposed for an additional ten thousand dollar increase for each. Um, I mean, an ad an additional five thousand dollar increase for each counselor um, to be a total of ten thousand dollars in um, compensation annual annually for counselors. Um, and I also just wanted to remind you all that this initiative that was brought forward by um, myself and counselor um, Michelle was with the intention of increasing diversity on our next council. Um, and so when I ran for to be a counselor, one of my goals was to recognize and address barriers to participation. Um, and this is and will continue to be one of the biggest barriers for people of different socioeconomic statuses for different like life makeups, different household compositions for different races and ethnicity, ethnicities for people with different experiences. And so I think it's very, very important to continue looking at it in that light as a, an initiative to increase diversity and par participation um, and not just simply as an increase to our salary. Um, another important thing to consider is that we're not, this is not an ask to increase our own, your own, salary. This is for the next council. It will not go into effect until January with the next council. So again, the real goal is to allow people with different perspective, different experiences, and different things to offer to this council to be able to successfully participate as a counselor. Um, and so I think it's very important to continue to look at that initiative in this way. Um, I am on the finance committee. This was my proposal and I did not support the recommendation that came forward from the um, finance committee for that exact reason, a $2,000 increase is not enough. That is $160 a month. When I talked about just my cost of getting childcare during these meetings, it eats up my entire stipend. So even if we're talking about reimbursement, that means I first need to pay my entire stipend for the childcare to then get it back. It's not enough. People with different experiences, different perspectives, which will greatly benefit our town and the outcomes in our town cannot participate on our council because they are not adequately compensated for the amount of time that it takes to be an effective counselor. Anybody can sit up here and just sit up here and make decisions blindly, but we also want, I think people who run for council want to be effective. They want to have time to read the materials. They want to have time to talk to constituents. They want to have time to do a good job. And so I think it's very important to consider what we would have to spend, what commitments we would have to make to make it more equitable and more inclusive and to elim eliminate this very important barrier, which Alicia. is a socioeconomic barrier. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I'm going to call on myself next and got my note. Okay. So the average babysitting cost in Massachusetts ranges, depending on which source you use, somewhere between 1670 and 2250. Nationally, it's $20.57 an hour for one child. So far, we've been here for a minimum of about $50 worth of time tonight, just to contextualize this. I don't know the average that you all spend on council work, but I do know that this job will take as much as you are willing to give to it and even more than what you are willing to give to it at times. 
I'm grateful that we have a pilot program in fiscal year 24. I think that is a very admirable, admirable move for family care. But if I were to take this very conservative estimate and say, you know, you're taking a week where you are really going to hold your boundaries, you're really, you're just going to go to a meeting, to your two meetings, right? Done, not even three, just two. So we're talking a minimum of six hours a week. That ends up being over $110 a week or over $6,000 a year. It's reasonable to say that that money that we're putting aside for this pilot in the next year could be used up by just a parent of one child who needs that support, as Alicia said, as a reimbursement. I think that we are all wish for a council with multiple parents on it to best represent our town. And I know that we currently have three counselors who are parents of school age kids, which is great. I'm incredibly present for the, grateful for their presence and their input here. But that $6,000 doesn't even include costs for meals, lost wages if hours are reduced to make council work fit in or more. We don't know our life everyone's life circumstances. Um, if we want to make holding this office an option for a broader group, we need to con con we need to consider which avenues must be opened up. I support this motion, but I wanted it to be higher. I said that at finance and I want it to be higher now because the reality is that a 40 hour a week job plus hours on council doesn't leave a lot left for other things like sleep, uh, relationships with friends and family, taking care of ourselves, maybe having a hobby that's not council. I don't know. Uh, increasing this stipend would allow people to do things like request partial leaves or cut down hours at work. It would allow people to support their families through through babysitting, right? Um, or or other family care. It would make this process slightly more reasonable for a broader part of our community, which I believe I have heard every single person talk about wanting to do at one point or another. This is one way we can do that. Thank you. I'm done uh, calling my, uh, Lynn, back to you. Yeah. Uh, Mandy Jo? Um, so I drafted a motion. I'll make it. I trust Paul will tell me whether it gets to what he explained or not. Um, it says, I move to amend the motion by deleting the phrase, a supplemental budget appropriation to meet said increase in accordance with charter section 5.6 and replacing it with the phrase options to the town council by October 1, 2023 for appropriating funding for said compensation. Um, Athena, you should have it in your email. Okay, for the purposes of discussion, I'm going to second the amendment. Uh, Paul, do you see any problems with that? No, I think that covers it. Okay. Uh, the, the motion's been made. It's on the floor. There's an amendment to that motion. If you want to speak to the motion, the amendment to the motion, that is where we are now. If there are later amendments to the whole motion, we need to go do this piece first. May I Andy speak Joe, to it myself? Like? Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I think Athena will work on getting it up, hopefully. Um, so I make this because I'm concerned about requiring that the manager find extra money somewhere not within the budget we already passed. And this gives him the option of finding it within the budget we already passed. We passed a, we pass a bottom line budget, which means if he wants to just move money around, we don't actually have to pass a new budget. Um, at least that's my understanding. And so this gives him the option, which um, makes it a lot more comfortable for me to vote for it, frankly, because of um, what Kathy was just saying about the school committee and the school budgets and all that I, I'm very comfortable, uncomfortable saying, find it outside of the budget we already passed. Um, so I, I'd really like to see his options, which is why I made this motion. So Athena, could you go to the top of where you are and actually red line into it? Meantime, uh, we're speaking to the amendment to the original motion, not anything else. The amendment to the original motion. Dorothy? Um, just to be clear, I um, what Mandy Jo is saying is to change where the town manager finds the money. Is that right? He, he's, she's giving the town manager more flexibility okay. to come back to the council and say, 
hey, I found the money. We don't need to amend the budget. We don't need a supplemental. He may have to come back and say that, but he right. has until October to determine what the options are. But I you might know, also point out by then is we also have usually have certified free cash. But there's but but that does not include and if he finds enough money to increase the stipend. No, <laughs> all this does is amend the existing motion, which is the seven thousand five hundred and the nine thousand for the present. Okay. All right. Well, that seems quite reasonable. Thank you. Okay. So is there any other comments regarding the amendment to the motion? Then I'm bringing that to vote. And we'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Okay. Yes. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, and I, Mandy Johannick. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller is absent. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Ball Milne is absent. It's unanimous 11 in favor, two people absent. Now we go back to the original motion. The original motion is in accordance with charter section 2.4 to adopt an increase to town council compensation in the amount of 2,500 for a total annual compensation of 7,500 for town council members and an increase of 2,000 for the town council president for a total of compensation, annual compensation of 9,500 effective January 2nd, 2024 and to request the town manager submit options to the town council by October 1, 2023 for appropriating funds for said compensation. Alicia. Um, I would like to make, move to make an amendment to the amounts for the compensation. Please. Do I need to forward something? Can I just, I would like to amend the 2,500 to 5,000, to 5, 000, the 7,500 to 10,000 and the 9,500 to 12,000. Okay. I second that. Okay. The motion has been made and seconded. Can I ask for clarification? Yes. So the what's this 2,000 getting amended to, Alicia, for the council president? I left it as two th as the in additional 2,000. So that would stay 9,500 then? Ooh. No. Because no. Lynn gets 7,500 right now, and that 2,000 goes up to 9,500. So you're trying to get two. the president up to 12? Yes. Yes. So yeah. I think that would be seven thousand for the council president. Then, no, so, five thousand. Five thousand. No, forty-five hundred. Okay. So it's a to total compensation of forty-five hundred for that. That two thousand would be forty-five hundred. No. Wait. I'm. No. no. I, let me let me try this, this Alicia. Is wrong. Okay? This, Alicia, this, let yes. me try this. Okay. You want to change the first twenty-five hundred to five thousand for a total compensation of ten thousand. Yes. For town council members and an increase of 2,000 for the council president for a total compensation of 12,000. No, no, because that, that motion is based on your current 7,500 compensation. That was what was wrong with the first motion. Yeah, go ahead. No, I don't think there's anything wrong with the first motion. Because first motion, first motion, Lynn gave you a two thousand increase rather than a twenty five hundred increase, so it worked perfectly right. well. Right, yeah. but it, when it says for a total annual compensation of, but the total the increase for the council president would be forty five hundred for a total annual compensation of twelve thousand. Right. Yeah. Right. I no. Okay, I hear. I see what you're doing. The two thousand needs to be xed out. Yeah, I don't. Okay, I just think of it differently. But anyway, 
Uh, that is the motion. It's been made and seconded. Now the discussion focuses on only this part of the amendment. The change, yes. Uh, exit full screen. Yes, they did. Dorothy did. Uh, is it okay if I speak to it just very quickly? Please go right ahead. Yeah, because I said most of my comments as to why my reasoning is for this, but I also just wanted to state that I think any increase would be beneficial, but I don't think a $2,000 increase is substantial enough to make the impact that I was looking to make with this motion. Um, and I know I heard Kathy say something about to the full amount, but in my opinion, even 10,000 isn't necessarily the full amount. Like Northampton did the study. If everybody read their study, they ended up increasing theirs to 16,000. And so who is to say that we wouldn't hire a committee or a commission to look at this and they would increase an additional amount? This is just the number that Michelle and I came to settle on as a number that we thought was substantial enough, but not too high in terms of still trying to be fiscally responsible because understanding the constraints of our current budget, but but suggesting an increase that is not substantial enough still does not achieve its intended goal. So while it might look performatively well, like we tried, it doesn't actually have the impact that it's intended to have. And so that's why I'm requesting this um, amendment. Okay. Are there any other comments at this time, Andy? Yeah, in this time I'm speaking on my uh, own. This is not on behalf of the committee. I am uncomfortable with an increase of uh, this amount that's being suggested for the reasons that are referred to in that section of the report, however, because I think that there are a couple of things that we need to recognize. One is, as has been um, mentioned already, the effect on uh, the uh, morale of other public officials who are in negotiations now, and that uh, the question of counsel, putting counselor stipends in a different class. Uh, the second thing is that uh, I really am concerned about um, our very generous taxpayers who just voted themselves a huge tax increase in order to build an elementary school. And I feel really uncomfortable then turning around and doing something that um, is this large for ourselves. And maybe the other, the last thing that I'll say, and just since I wanna be brief on this, is that uh, for all that Northampton did in their increases, I don't find that it relevant because I made this reference in earlier comments on a different subject uh, this evening, but when you go over to Northampton and you drive up and down King Street and you drive up and down Pleasant Street, uh, you uh, see a lot of commercial activity and commercial growth that we don't have and probably won't have. Uh, you know, car dealer row isn't here and it's not coming here, for example. So I just don't think that uh, we can ever be comparing ourselves to Northampton because they are such a different classification economically. And we ultimately have to look at the fact that we're um, a very high property tax community because it falls so heavily on a very single segment of homeowners and uh, I, um, it just makes me very uncomfortable um, to um, ask for this kind of an increase for the council. Uh, Dorothy, I believe you're next. Okay. I'm trying to open my, okay, there you can see me. Okay, uh, given, given our financial realities, we really can't afford to increase this, the stipend at all. I totally agree. I understand. We are greatly taxed. Uh, we certainly got a big uh, increase, but we spent most of this evening, once again, talking about democracy in the town of Amherst. 
And the people who are pay, suffering from our high taxes perhaps would like to have a more representative council. We would be speaking to many of the issues that are of concern to them. And Alicia made it clear that this increase that she is seeking is not really gonna be just compensation for the amount of work the counselor does, but it is a symbolic statement that she thinks will be sufficient to encourage a broader group of people to run for town council. I think that would be very, very important. And there's always reasons why, I mean, I am as upset as, as, as Kathy is about the school budget and the uh, lack of funding for certain positions and, and actually the, the rates of funding for certain things. But we have to deal with the problem of, are we speaking for the whole town? And right now, I don't think we are. So this is an act that will be real and symbolic that should result in a more representative, diverse crop of town councilors to deal with the problems that face a wider array of people in the town. So I really strongly think that we should say yes on this one. Thank you. Alicia, I'm gonna to go to Kathy and then come back to you. I, I, I'll just, I just wanna underscore what I said earlier. Um, I actually very much disagree um, with going all, all the way to 10,000 on, and it is a $2,500 increase, it's not a 2,000. And I think um, if you talk to a lot of people in town, they're worried that we're not financially accountable as a council in terms of um, adding new departments that we've added, there's not widespread support. And some of what we've been doing is in the name of social equity, of thinking about doing things differently, but we've really been stretching the limits um, with decisions we've made and people are watching that. And I think we need to be accountable for this year to say we've just asked a lot, including water and sewer rates, and we too need to um, be um, parsimonious with ourselves. And $2,500 is a substantial increase. Yes, it's not 5,000. So I will not be voting for this um, the same way I was not voting for it in the Finance Committee. Mandy Jo. Andy asked earlier what the Charter Commission was thinking. Um, so as for when we have to vote this, it was because the Charter Commission did not believe that the council members should vote their own salaries. And so what Alicia, I think it was Alicia said earlier about this is not an increase for us. We have an election coming up. We made it so early so that the people would be able to weigh in on whether they thought what we did was right, which is why we had put it six months before the end of the term and three months before the election or so. Um, and so that people could decide if the compensation was something they could deal with with running instead of doing it after people could did not have those options again. How did we get to 5,000 and 7,500? The original intent of those numbers was to try and ensure when we had no idea exactly how long council time would take that anyone who needed to pay for child care or elder care would have enough money from this compensation to do so. From what Anna said and from what Alicia has said, and given we all know how many meetings we're now attending and how long they are, it appears that that is not, we, that the Charter Commission did not set the compensation high enough. Um, it is up for people to decide what that is, but that's how the, if people are wondering, that's where the Charter Commission was thinking in setting these numbers, a number that would ensure that someone who ran for council and served on council did not actually lose money by serving on council because of the expenses they needed to incur to serve on council. Pat? I'm, kind of, I'm like Kathy, I cannot support this increase. Um, 
And I keep thinking about my work as a member of the mobile market in Amherst and policy council. People who have come and Sorry, Pat, but I can't hear you on Zoom. Um, no, I'm sorry. There was no compensation. Uh, for a few people in the mobile market, there became jobs. Uh, and that was part of our plan. So I cannot raise the salary as high as you're requesting. But what I want to challenge us to do as a council, because we do need other voices, I want us to really go out and reach out to people who live in the boulders, the people who are uh, using the survival center and, and find ways to get them involved in town government, whether it's on committees or on council. And another way of doing that is we, we all our meetings are translated. We still don't do that. And there are plenty of people in this town who do not speak English well enough to participate, yet when they're able to speak in their own language, the what you learn and what they challenge us to create is phenomenal. So I, I, I think that while I can't support your request, Alicia, for this amount of money, I do want us, I want to challenge us to really move forward outward to the community because it's a lot broader than even you're talking about it uh, in terms of income and everything else. But what the community does have is a real willingness to commit to hard work. And we pretend that isn't true because we don't offer them the ability to be here. Um, so that sounded like a contradiction, but um, I think you get my idea. Alicia, you have your hand up. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to offer a couple of more comments. Um, sorry. I think, again, these conversations are always really difficult for me, so I'm breathing. Um, Alicia, you need to speak oh. to your, <laughs> thank you. Can you, you can hear me now I can yes okay great sorry I was just trying to take a deep breath anyhow um so I just I can't understand when someone is saying that they're uncomfortable giving somebody else equitable compensation I mean we're talking about equitable compensation for a position as critical as being a town counselor who has the ability to have influence on every single major discussion that happens in this entire town. I don't look at this for me personally as a different, like a different flask, or I'm not sure the exact comparison that Andy used for the school committee coming to asking us for more money, putting this in a different flask and looking in a different light. One, because I voted yes to that anyhow. So I was in favor of giving them what they were asking for. And two, because when people are saying we're financially or fiscally irresponsible, it's because we approved monies to demolish a gas station for aesthetic reasons that if we didn't vote for that, we could have used that money to fund both of those initiatives. So when we're thinking about what decisions we make as a council, we always have decisions and our decisions always have impacts and outcomes in the community we wouldn't even need to go do outreach in the boulders if we could increase the compensation so that somebody who lived there could be on the council. I have used the survival center for my entire life. When I was younger and we didn't have food, my mother brought us to the survival center for dinner. I still go to the survival center to get groceries for my family because as a single mother of three, I cannot afford to always put food on my table. If you want to hear from people who use the survival center, hello, I am here and I am telling you that you need to provide more if you want people like me to be able to be on the council. It is not going to happen with a $2,000 increase. Like I said, that is 160 extra dollars a month, which can do absolutely nothing. 
That is not a, an impact. That is not a dent. That is not how we get peoples in the communities who we do not hear from. Yes, translation, that is, all of those things are important. And I very much appreciate all of your comments, Pat. Like I do hear you and I don't want you to think that this is directly at you, but it is, very hard because we always are constantly saying we want to hear more from these people and when these people come and talk to us we don't listen to them how do we want to hear more how are we going to hear more if we don't compensate people how if we want people who live in the boulders we want people who use the survival center we want people who don't have who aren't financially stable all of the time. We want to hear what would help them. We have to pay them. How else are we going to free up their time to hear from them? That is literally the entire point of what I am trying to do here. Thank you. Are there any other counselor comments at this time? There is an amendment on the floor. The amendment is shown on the screen. Um, it increases the 2,500 to 5,000. It increases the total compensation for counselors to 10,000. It increases the president's compensation so that it would be a total of 12,000, 2,000 more than all counselors. Are there any other comments? If not, we'll move to a vote on the amendment. I'm going to start with Anna Devlin Goth here. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is a nay. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Shulman is absent. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. No. Andy Steinberg. No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. The eyes have it with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven votes. Did I get that right? And seven in favor, four opposed, and two absent. The motion passes with, uh, and we will move on to the next item. We, we need to vote we have the motion. To vote. Oh, the we motion. have to do the, the total motion. Okay. All right. So the motion now is in accordance with Charter Section 2.4 to adopt an increase to town council compensation in the amount of 5000 for a total of compens annual compensation of 10000 for town council members and an increase of 4500 for the council president for a total annual compensation of 12000 effective January second 2024 and to request the town manager submit options to the town council by october 1st 2023 for appropriating funding for said compensation that motion is now the motion that's on the table okay all right we'll begin in this case with lynn griesmer and i'm a nay mandy johanneke aye We're voting on the full motion as it appears on the screen where everything in red is also now in black. Yes. yes. <clears throat> that Pam, the, the, the previous vote was to was to change it with what's shown in red. And now the vote is to vote to approve or not approve the entire motion, not just to make changes. No, the, the earlier motion, the previous like motion the was the thing. amendment. It's like the same thing, but you have to vote the whole motion. Okay. All right. So, Mandy Joe, hold on. I need to just find it on a place. We're to Anika. Hold yeah. on. I was an I. Mandy Joe is an I. Anika? I. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? No. Andy Steinberg? No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's seven 
in favor, four opposed, two absent. We're going to move on to proposed specialized opt-in energy code. Anna, you are the sponsor of this. And I would love to introduce a very, very special guest. This is Jesse Selman. He is a member of the Energy and Climate Action Committee. I'd also like to extend my deep gratitude to the ECAC. I see several of their members on this call. They're the ones who initially outreached uh, about this idea and um, have been doing a lot of the work to prep it for y'all. So I just wanna extend some gratitude to one of our fabulous committees. Um, I'm gonna just give a quick overview and then really turn it over to Jesse uh, and, and he's gonna lead you through this because as we know, building codes are notoriously simple and easy to understand. So I sent you a memo, it was in your packet and I just wanna to touch on some high points of it. What we are asking for is uh, for the town of Amherst to opt in to a higher level of specialized stretch code than we currently have opted into with the existing stretch code. Some people have heard this referred to as a stretchier code. It's actually, it's, it's funny because it's actually less stretchy is the point. Uh, we stretch further. I'm going to stop saying the word stretch. So basically the specialized opt-in code ensures that new buildings in Amherst are going to be more resilient in the face of climate change. So when we think about, we're seeing heat waves. I mean, it was 85 degrees today and it's not even July, uh, deep freezes, other major changes to the world in which we live in. How it does this is that it requires more efficient measures in new buildings and significant retrofits. This code builds on the existing stretch code uh, and brings in increasingly strict standards for energy efficiency, such as higher levels of insulation, uh, high performance windows and doors, increased air tightness. The opt-in code recognizes that not all buildings can be built or renovated to net zero standards, and so it offers several pathways to full electrification, including mixed fuel, provided that the building is able to be fully electrified in the future. So for larger buildings, over 4,000 square feet, the requirement is that they either produce zero emissions or be fully electrified. We adopted the energy stretch code over 10 years ago in 2012. That code updated in 2023, and that's when the specialized energy code was introduced. Adoption of the opt-in code, which is optional, sends a strong message that our community isn't going to wait until those energy efficiency measures outlined in the, the opt-in code become required, which is very clearly the direction that this is going. We are being proactive, we are being progressive in requiring them now if we choose to go with the opt-in code. Ultimately, it's clear that we will need these changes in the not so distant future. When I was talking about this with Jesse, I was like, so like 10 or 15 years. And he was like, no, like three to five max, right? Like we're talking that these are happening increase with increasing speed. Requiring them now allows builders to avoid costly retrofits or owners to avoid costly retrofits down the road. I included some FAQs from uh, DOER, Mass Department of Energy Resources, as well as a really great chart from the folks in Watertown, Mass, who are one of the communities that has opted into this code. I hope that you'll join me in supporting moving forward with the uh, specialized opt-in stretch code, and I would love to turn it over to Jesse for a presentation. And Athena, if you don't mind driving, that would be phenomenal. Thank you. Please go ahead, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you all. I know it's been a long night. Uh, appreciate the time. This is probably 40, 50 minutes tops. <laughs> so you didn't talk to me before then. <laughs> <laughs> the so, word brief. I'm here on behalf of the ECAC to recommend the adoption of the specialized code. Next slide. <laughs> Doing well. So here's kind of a quick update of what's there. The base code's off the table. You already voted out of that. The, the, I think what's important about this slide is that the stretch code updates on its own and will update again on July 1st, 2024. July 1st, 2024 is probably the soonest you could have the specialized code in place and they will be very almost the same thing by then. So really, in some ways, this is a political move to say, Yes, we support this. It will not have a dramatic effect on the code. Next slide. Uh, this is a big list here, and I think this is always evolving and changing as I read this today. Um, I think the, the takeaway I would say is DOER did a study 
all buildings types that see the improved codes have a lower life cycle cost. Some building types even have a lower initial cost. Um, I think you can read this on your own time. Next slide. It was also in our packet. Thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah. Um, this is a, sort of the technical language of how buildings are rated. It's a HERS rating. If you're curious, you want to learn more, ask me at the end. If you're not curious, don't. Um, but I think it, it's going to get better in a year. I think, and it's just got better in January for residential buildings. It's going to get better in July for commercial buildings. Um, questions? Next slide. I think what's important about the commercial buildings is what they're part of what's exciting to me about this code, and this is part of the stretch code anyway, but is they're making electrification and renewables possible by they're changing the way buildings are judged, not just make it a little bit better than what's there, rather reducing the total amount of energy demand and peak demand situations. I heard that Williamsburg had a blackout yesterday because of too much air conditioning yesterday wasn't even that hot so this is about resiliency and really dovetailing with the rest of the state's um, climate readiness plans next slide this is an exciting one for me because um, this is actually a building type that we see a lot of in this town uh, particularly as new construction and it's a really good match for a low energy building, which is a multifamily um, homes and even a mixed use multifamily. And they're the it's a great match for the passive house standard, which means these are, this is a really durable, really resilient, low utility bills, great indoor air quality. It's a good match for housing. Question, next slide. Questions, comments. Okay. Can I? Uh, yes. Jesse, could you speak a little bit about the, um, you and the ECAC team spoke to town staff about this. Uh, this was not just an EC, I mean, it was, it was an ECAC was the electric motor, but what, um, can you speak to the, the support that you received from town staff as well? Yes. Um, I, I think what towns they've given, we've met with them twice and them is the thank you the inspection services rob mora and dave wiskavitz i'm really trying to go fast i know people want to go home all right um oh believe me you're not between us and going home <laughs> there's so much else <laughs> we spoke with the inspection services and they and we kind of had a really good back and forth about pros and cons how does this affect builders how does this affect developers homeowners etc um it doesn't have a big impact on inspection services and in that to meet this code it's it is and has been under the stretch code is outsourced to a hers rater or a building energy specialist so it's not additional work for the town um and they did express some specific concerns about um technology being available for example if a um, electrical meter sockets, things that have long lead times, will just have a direct, dramatic negative impact on construction projects. And given the timeline that we're talking about, which is getting approval before the end of this year and having it enacted by July 1st, 2024, we don't, we all agree, we didn't think that was a problem. So they are in support of this, as we've been talking about. Thank you. And um, Lynn, if I may, just one more part of the, technically, I think I'm still in the presentation part. Um, what we are asking for today is a referral to CRC, as well as a review for clarity, consistency, and actionability by GOL. Um, this goes to CRC as it primarily has to do with buildings. Um, and we, I believe that this was the most appropriate path uh, for this in terms of where it should be referred to. So we're asking for referral today. It will be discussed thoroughly and then come back to the council. But uh, and Jesse, yeah, anything. And I would add to that that the ECAC is available to support 
that conversation and committee, as well as DOER, Department of Energy Resources. They routinely speak to towns um, about what this means. They answer questions. They've done a ton of studies on cost impacts, on climate impacts, et cetera, et cetera. They Thank are, you. They are the current experts in this code. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. So I'm going to go to council questions and before we put a motion, but I'm going to put a motion on the floor pretty soon. Kathy? Um, my main question um, is, well, it's a two-part question, whether we really need to do this or not as a town because of, and it's mainly because we were just recently briefed by the elementary, the we is the elementary school building committee on Teddy. And I won't even begin to try to tell you what Teddy actually is, but the, uh, it wasn't enough that we were a low energy building and that we were net zero energy building. We are going to have to in for some additional costs for the envelope of the building, including the windows um, and, uh, and some insulation. And that's a statewide standard. So if that's coming in and it's gonna affect private buildings as well as public buildings, does Amherst need to go further than the state code is all already going? And it took quite some doing and modeling before our modelers could even conceived that any school could meet the new standards. And then as a result of working with the OR, they redid the model and they redid the specs on two ends. So they both agreed that it was possible to build a school that had windows. Let's talk about it, that, that let light into it without, um, and because we weren't building a cave. So I'm just questioning whether we need to take this extra step as opposed to the state is already taking a very big step. And um, it, and and I don't really need an answer for it right now because it was a complicated enough explanation about what Teddy was versus um, energy use intensity. Um, we'd already built a, a, an extremely tight building, which is what our geothermal um, rebate is gonna be, not a rebate, it's a advance. So it's not clear to me that we need to take another step given the big step the state is already taking. That is my question and comment. And since it's so technical, I'm not sure whether this needs just to go to CRC to get those answered or not. But I'm worried about spending a lot of time on this if the answer is the state code is already going really far, we don't need to go further. Thanks. May I, may I respond briefly and ask Jesse if he has a response? I'm sorry, what? May I respond briefly and then ask Jesse if he has anything to add? Please. So, I, I mean, I, I think yes, right? Like there's a reason why this is called an opt-in code. It's because that there's, there are things that we have the option to opt into. Um, I think it's important to note, right, our current uh, net zero law, a bylaw of, uh, accounts for town buildings um, and we want, to, we want to be broader, right? I think that if the state code were enough, um, and even with the updates which happened this year, if they were enough, then the specialized opt-in code wouldn't exist. So I think the opt-in code allows us to be out ahead of the curve. Um, and when we're talking about climate change and climate action, I, I think more of us need to be out ahead of the curve. That curve is, is way too slow behind. Uh, Jesse, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to Kathy's question. I think it's a good question. The Teddy thermal energy demand intensity, I believe, would be, is, that's maybe the most complicated and difficult leap that's happening anyway, that happens in a couple of weeks for all building permitted in this town. So it, the, the bump up into the specialized code is actually far less demanding than just the natural stretch code updates. It's, you know, is, so I, I don't know if it actually makes it that much harder. I think it, it's my read of it is it makes it better, not harder. Dorothy. Um, okay, I'll do that again. Uh, I, I like this proposal because maybe even 50 years ago, uh, LaGuardia, and I was a, an elected official actually at that time, LaGuardia Community College came to, you know, is a public school. Uh, to get extra money to build handicapped accessible restrooms. And I said, but they just built it last year. 
why, why would they not have done it when they built it? And the answer was, it wasn't required then. So this is saying you don't have to do all of this. There's opt-in, but it's showing the way forward so that people can avoid the, the stupid waste of public money of having to do something when you're told you have to do it, when you could have done it um, because it was a good thing to do it. And then later on, you're gonna to be told you have to do it. And I think Anna is right. The field is moving very, very fast. Um, at the moment, I'm feeling very lucky to be here in Western Massachusetts and not um, fearing wildfires. We, we don't know where the summer will bring, but um, it, the climate change is very big, very real and very sudden and is making it impossible to live in huge areas of the country. So I think we have to um, try to work with people to help them be ready to be forward thinking, to move ahead and to be ready to keep making those changes. It, it is complex, I do admit. So I, I do support this. Thank you. Pat. There's a, a lot that I support here. I'm a member of CRC and I'm a member of GOL. GOL would have to get it. I want to know why ECAC and the sponsor aren't do, ma making the changes that have to happen in in the stretch code in our stretch code and then bringing it to GOL. Why do you want CRC to do the work that I think your committee should be doing? So we can't change any of the codes. No one here can. That's it, we can't even propose to change the codes. That's well way outside of any of our jurisdiction. And and maybe we didn't, I, I don't know that this is, this is not a big, this doesn't involve designing standards or cust customizing any standards to this town. It's a, it's a binary yes or no. You either do it or you don't. There's no argument on the language. It's, 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 it's very, it's, Yes, you Wait, cannot change. Yeah, you're not allowed. You to. Cannot change it. <laughs> so I think that's that's appealing, and that's part of why we actually do feel comfortable making the ask that you spend time on it, is because you can't get bogged down in the language of it. You could, you either like it or you don't. And I'm not. I mean, you heard what I think, but it, it's yeah. I think it's it is simpler than that, possibly. Should the council choose to send this strictly to GOL for actionability? Um, I would not say no to that because that would get it done faster. We thought it would be appropriate to send it to committee as all of our other bylaws do go through, tend to, my understanding is they go through committee. Um, hang on, I have to sneeze. Thank you. Uh, however, we, we did feel it was appropriate to send this to CRC, even though what Jesse said, I wanna be very clear on, we do not have legal leeway to edit anything about this code. It is a up or down, um, but, it was. It seemed worth it to have more of an opportunity versus strictly at a council meeting for a committee to dig in and discuss it. But I appreciate your sentiment, and I'm don't disagree with you. If we could pass it tonight. I'd say, yeah, let's do it. Andy, perfect timing for what I was going to say because I appreciate what Pat raised. I have uh, sort of been the voice for this council in asking us. Every time we do a referral to committees for some new proposal that we've not dealt with that's going to require time of committees, both the original committee that it's assigned to and GOL, to take a step back and to think about what the capacity is of this council to handle it and what is the capacity of our staff to provide the support that's necessary for the committees and the council to make a wise decision that they're being asked to make. And I think that if, uh, this is just another example of uh, a proposal that I just urge all of my fellow counselors to think about very carefully because it's again, um, making a big ask of CRC making an ask of GOL. It has a very, um, uh, what may be unrealistic timeline requirement. And given the fact that we're getting into the summer months where uh, it's gonna be harder to get committees together to meet, um, I, I um, have real concerns about uh, 
taking this council in its last uh, six months of work and creating yet another new um, requirement and to at least make sure that we just don't uh, support it because we think, gee, it sounds great, but we also think about uh, what is our capacity to do it. Mandy Joe, Can I respond to that? Yeah. I take exception to the phrase, gee, it sounds great. Eight very hardworking people who care about this issue deeply spent a lot of time preparing this. I know I rushed through my presentation, but we are professionals in this field and we made that decision that it's important to do. It may or may not be the right thing. You might not do it. I think that's belittling it a little bit. The other thing I will say is we will continue to support the process to make it as easy as possible for the council to do this work. We'll do continue to do the research. We'll continue to network th with DOER. So I want to offer up that support as well so that it is less of a burden to this group. Mandy Joe. Thank you. Um, I'm chair of CRC and I sit on GOL. <laughs> So I have some practical questions that may result in me when the motion is made, asking for more than 45 days. Well, I was reading I the DOER do. um, guidance on this and the, uh, the paragraph on page four at the very top of the page stuck out at me because it says in order to be adopted, the regulations must be considered at an appropriate municipal public hearing subject to the municipality's existing public notice provisions. So I'm curious whether that is after adoption or before adoption, because we wouldn't, you know, so I, I would need to know whether CRC or GOL is holding a public hearing. And if we have to hold a public hearing, we need more time <laughs> because of the notice requirements for, for publishing in, in two weeks and all of that. Um, you know, and so Basically, what, what I will say is if this is referred to CRC, I would be going to Paul immediately and saying, hey, Paul, um, can we get a legal opinion on what the change to the bylaw needs? The bylaw right now that adopted the stretch code is literally like two sentences. And so I foresee that we might only have to change the reference to from stretch to specialized, um, but I'd need the right CMRs, I'd need the right thing. So I would be going to the legal to say, do we need to hold that public hearing? Is it us or is it the council? Um, and what is the language that we need? And then we'd be following that. I don't know whether that needs to be at CRC or whether um, <laughs> that's like, give it to CRC if there's a public hearing. But CRC regularly holds public hearings and GOL doesn't. And if the hearing is on the actual regulations, it actually makes more sense to send it, I think, to CRC than to just GOL if you're literally going to get builders in talking about the specifics of the regulations at a public hearing. Mandy, I appreciate you speed checking me with my secret desire to just pass it today. Um, no, I think that that's valid. And I agree in terms of the the timing for um, for public noticing and all of that. Really, the 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 purpose here is, you know, to and, and to kind of address Andy's point too, to do our jobs. Right. And I think that our job is to put this through committee. Our job is to properly notice it. Our job is to pass laws that we believe are important for the future of our town. Uh, and so that is, that is, that's the goal here, right? Is that this is, this is about the future. Of, I mean, it goes beyond our town because climate change doesn't really respect municipal boundaries, but um, yeah, Mandy, to, to get kind of down to the nuts and bolts of it, I think that we can be flexible in that provided that we do need that public notice and that public hearing. Um, the way that Jesse explained it, and I'm going to say it and then you're going to correct me, uh, I'm sure. So the way that Jesse explained it is we have either July or January in terms of July's or January's to adopt, right? And then to implement. So um, we're not going to hit July. I'm not crazy, but I'd really love to get it done before January because at that point, who knows who's going to be sitting at this, what's this called? Dias? Dias? This oblong round lima bean table. Uh, so so I think that that's as long as we can really get it done. And I, and I think expediency is important because I also think that prioritizing, not necessarily bumping this up in CRC's agenda, I'm not asking for that, but showing that this is a priority and showing that the council is attentive to it also sends a message, right? This is a very practical, absolutely a practical code in all of that. 
and how we approach it and how we deal with it is a political action as well. It covers both bases. And so I think that as for us prioritizing it in terms of saying, yes, we are going to get this done. I'm committed to that. ECAC is really supportive um, and, and committed to that as well. So long, long story short, yes, absolutely. We'll make it work. Jesse, did I get anything wrong? Oh, that's, that's Thank you. So, stuff. I don't know, understand how any of that works. I'm, I'm going to use my privilege as a counselor to speak to this. And I really am going to ask that you all consider what we have to accomplish between now and the end of December and whether or not this truly can fit in the calendar, not just for CRC, I totally appreciate ECAC's stepping to the plate. Our staff and the council deliberation. And I, I have serious reservations knowing what else is out there that you all have already put on the docket. And so I'm questioning where our staff is on this. I'm questioning that every time we say a committee's going to do the work, then we run into issues of do you really have the time? So I'm just questioning it because I can go through all of the outstanding things and it'll scare the bejesus out of you that we have on our plate to get done between now and December. And as you said, Anna, this is not the kind of thing that you want to then say, gee, pass this off to the next council. So that's my reservation. It's, hey, I was on the first council. The first thing we did was create ECAC and adopt our goals. So it's not, but it was very near the, nearly the first thing. Um, so I just really have to ask the question, whether we have the bandwidth in our council, in our staff, and in our meeting time. Gosh, I hope we do, because respectfully, we don't really have a lot of other options. I think that our committee chairs know exactly what's on their plates. And I think that if our committee chairs can handle this, that's, that's great. But I also think that this is not a measure that's going to take significant deliberation because we can't change it. So there is deliberation that can happen and the public hearing that will happen. But ultimately, I believe that, you know, and, and I can check with our committee chairs on this. I also believe I, I, that we're negating the fact that ECAC did a significant amount of due diligence in speaking to town staff about this. This was, that was the, one of the first things I asked uh, uh, Vasu and Jesse was, did you talk to town staff and what do they think? Because that is always a consideration. Um, and I, and I also respectfully, first council didn't pass this wasn't brought forward. Would have been great. So let's get it done now. Let's not kick it down the road to the next council. Mandy Joe. If it is referred to CRC, CRC will get it done. <laughs> I can't guarantee about our nuisance that we've had referred to us, but but I, we've we've got exactly basically two referrals right now we're working on because we just made a recommendation on one. Tonight has um, all of the appointments that CRC has been working through. CRC after now has outstanding rental registration, which is nearly done. Um, <laughs> in terms of where we're getting to, I'm hoping to by the in the next two meetings to be able to get something to this council on that. Um, and then we have nuisance. This can easily fit into that schedule. Well, the fees, no, the fees, that's part of rental registration. We can do it. My belief is we can do it. My committee might not believe me. Um, so I, I believe CRC has the time to get it done. Um, but what I wanted to say really was one of the first major things the very first council did was adopt climate action goals of net neutrality. Mm -hmm by 2050, a decrease of 25% by 2025, I believe that is two years from now, and a decrease of 50% by 2030. Jesse will correct me if I'm 2035. 
something like that. Jesse will correct me. He knows it more than me. Um, every building that is built new that uses fossil fuels that cannot easily be converted to not using fossil fuels from this day forward prevents us from getting to net zero net new carbon neutrality by 2050 because that building will still exist in 2050. That is literally 27 years from now. My own home is older than that right now. And in adding mini splits on an oil-based system, my family found out how hard it is to fully figure out how to get rid of and not use that oil at all. Um, so any delay in saying, or any way to say our stretch code is good enough because it will eventually get us there when we could adopt a, a, a super stretch code, stretchy stretch code, specialized code, whatever you want to call it, that will mandate those buildings be done and to this standard quicker is one more way we as a town council can help our manager fulfill his manager goals that we adopted and told him to do and how we as a town council can stand up and say, we're serious about those climate action goals we adopted. Because anytime we say build a building that uses natural gas or any other fossil fuel, or well, we'll just renovate it and keep that in there instead of converting is another tick against us meeting those goals. Pam. I think that's a good thing, but I am uh, I am worried about the level of research and um, and ramifications of you know what does this what does this actually require homeowners in Amherst to do? Um, are we are we are we push? I mean, and whether this is a good or bad thing, I'm not I'm not saying that, but there's. I feel like all of these things that we tackle, there is a huge learning curve for most people, most of us. And my concern is, um, are we driving people to be required to have solar on their roofs? Is that something that? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that allays a little, I mean, it, it's not possible for everybody to do it, so. I don't know. I don't want future homeowners to say I can't afford to build an Amherst because it's too expensive. We have enough housing. We have enough housing issues as it is. Paul, you have your hand up. I do. So um, I think uh, Pam was actually hitting on something I was going to say, which is the ramifications. And I think that the council will want to be doing its due diligence and it, as, as it moves forward, one of those ramifications is what is the cost to anybody pulling a building permit. There's other concerns like, and Jesse referenced already, it's a supply chain issue. Can you comply with the, the new stretch code if the, if the parts aren't there and available? The other concern we have, and you know, talking to the building commissioner is, how do we train our staff to be able to implement it? There are no classes out here. There's no uh, training that's being offered by the state in this area. I mean, that's all stuff that has to be developed and delivered. We don't have the capacity to send our staff to Boston to get trained. So we have a lot of building inspectors who would need to get up to speed on it. It's complicated. So we want to take into account the implementation and I would hope the council would invite in the building commissioner to understand what are the challenges of implementing it, as well as the, you know, it's a simple binary yes, no vote on it, but I think there's some things that go along with it. And I think it's, so I don't not want to undersell how complicated it is, for, but the council will want to do its due diligence because they're going to hear from their constituents when they come to get a building permit and they're told you need to do this in order to get a building permit to do whatever it is. We're going to do this at some point because the state's going to go there and we're going to, it's just a matter of when we do it. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So I just think the council will want to do, use its, you know, its public hearing process and stuff to understand it. So I think if you get started on it, 
you know, if Mandy Jo usually delivers on what she says she's going to deliver on, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that can be done this calendar year, but I don't think we should be overly optimistic about voting on it tonight, um, because I think there is some conversation that has to happen. I was mostly joking, but yes, thank you. Paul. I know. Pam, you still have your hand up. All right. The motion that is on our sheet is to refer the memorandum regarding specialized opt-in energy code to Community Resources Committee to develop amendments to general bylaw 3.48 stretch energy code consistent with the memo and to the governance organization and legislation committee to review said amendments for clarity, consistency, and actionability with a report back to the town council within 45 days of transmission from the community resources committee. Can we just make it 90 days period and ignore the rest of the end of that sentence? Within 90 days end the sentence there. All right, that's the motion. Is there a second? Second, Devlin got there. All right, any other comments? Okay. Mandy Jo? Are we voting? Yes. Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? I'm gonna abstain because I don't understand the ramifications this enough. I, I, so putting everyone through the work to bring this back to them, I'm gonna have questions. So I have to abstain. Andy? I hate abstaining, but I'm gonna also have to abstain because I really don't understand this. We rushed to this particular motion that's on the floor so fast. Okay. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin got here. Aye. You skipped Taub and Walker. I'm sorry. It's because it's in the next sheet. Oh. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. And how did you vote, Lynn? I'm sorry? And how did you vote, Lynn? I, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> I have to flip the damn sheet. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to vote aye with serious reservations. So it passes. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, nine in favor, two abstentions, two absent. Thank you Thank so you much, Jesse. Us, Jesse. Thank you all for your time. For those that abstained, I'm going to work very hard to make it more clear. And for those with reservations, I'm going to work very hard to make it easier. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you to the rest of the ECAC team for working so hard on this. All right, we are coming, we are back to the proposed rescission and replacement of bylaw 3.4 snow and ice. Um, this was brought before the group before, and there has been a one change made. I'm going to call on Pat DeAngelis to discuss that change. Thank you. Uh at our last meeting, we decided uh, to keep the 24 hour period for snow and ice removal uh, with enforcement being a warning for the first uh, non clearance of a sidewalk by an owner and um, fine after that um, for the same owner. It was also um, to, uh, decided to keep the same day 24 hour period for uh, waste container removal. And it was the discussion of section B, which about overhanging ve vegetation, where there was a language change. And that is for the purposes of this bylaw, vegetative overgrowth extending into the sidewalk zone or overhanging the sidewalk 10 feet or less above the sidewalk shall be considered an obstruction. And from what I understand, Pam Rooney and Jennifer Taub went riding around on bikes to get this figure. I have an amendment to make. I would like to lower that height to eight feet, not 10 feet. Okay. Hold on one second. Um, Pat, anything else? 
Okay. So the uh, motion that will be put on the motion I'm putting on the floor is the following in accordance with Charter Section 2.10A to rescind bylaw 3.40 and replace it with bylaw 3.40 obstruction of public ways and snow and ice removal as shown on page 14 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion. Pam, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I did communicate with the chair of GOL and, and had initially suggested 10 feet because it added some additional height to what would norm normally be within the reach of a, of a cyclist. But after walking several uh, several side streets and realizing that vegetation at eight feet is still above a, a cyclist head, you know, they don't have to stand up on their <laughs> on their pedals and try to hit the limbs overhanging their 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 sidewalk. It just isn't that critical. And there are some wonderful intimate spaces that are created with an eight foot branch. And um, so I would I would like to change that to eight feet, please. And then I had one other correction in the last paragraph um, in the third line, it says, well, it starts out by saying, in addition to the remedies provided above, the town manager may, blah, 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 clause, 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 recover from the owner the expense, therefore, so we need to delete the words again and may recover. It's just a leftover wording. So let me just make sure I understand the motion. First of all, was the motion seconded? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so your, your amendment is as follows, and I'm looking for the second, okay? It's under B1 to change 10 feet to eight feet. Yes. B3. Three. I'm sorry, B3, 10 feet to eight feet. Yes, okay. And then in D to remove after the comma, and may just after the, may. After the word bylaw after the word bylaw remove and may you can't remove the and just just may okay um okay there a uh, amendment's been made is there a second I, I, so i'm not even sure the may i i know there's two mays there um, Ma Mandy, I don't think there was a second yet. Was there a second on that motion? Well, I'm, I, I'm just clarifying whether we need that amendment at all. <laughs> Jennifer. Why well, second the first part? I'll, but I'll second it, but I would defer to Mandy too. Okay. So the motion, the amendment's now been made and seconded. Now we're back to yeah. I I guess so. Sorry, my question on the second the removal of the may is if we remove that may, I think before you can recover, you'd have to again give due notice right. because of how the sentence is written. The town manager may after due notice and an opportunity for the owner of the real property to be heard. All of that is included then in the clause for recover from the owner the expenses therefore so um, you're saying the may should stay in terrible sentence <laughs> yes you're saying the may should stay in that's my thinking yeah, I, but i just want I'm, clarification from other people who read it as to whether i'm thinking properly or not okay uh as the person who made the motion, do you accept that we are leaving the May in? Do you accept the fact that we're leaving the May in? Got it. Um, I understand, believe me. Jennifer, do you accept leaving the May in since you seconded it? Yes. Okay. So at this point, the amendment is to change 10 feet to eight feet. Are there any further conversations about that? All right. Then, uh, I'm Kathy. Sorry, Kathy, just just a very quick 
I'm in a different time zone and I'm going to need to leave. So I just wanted everyone to know that when my camera goes dark, it's because I'm not there anymore. So I won't be voting on this. I'm okay. okay. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, all right. We are voting on the amendment. We're voting on the amendment only at this point. I'm starting with Anika. Oh, aye. Yes. Aye. Um, Michelle is absent. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane is now absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne is absent. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothi. Aye. Reese Merzen. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Unanimous with three absent. Um, now we're going to go to the original uh, motion, except for the fact that we have changed it from 10 feet to eight feet. And this is just one of those housekeeping weird things. Okay. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So this is the second time this evening that we've had the same situation. I do thought, I thought I recalled in town meeting if an amendment was made and passed that then that article was accepted. If it didn't pass, you went back to the original article and voted on that. So why are we having to do these twice? I'm going to look to my parliamentarians. So the vote, first you vote to amend the original motion. So here's the original motion is in accordance with charter section such and such. Now you've made a suggestion to change the bylaw from 10 feet to eight feet. And the body gets to decide if they wanna make that change before they make the change to the bylaw. So first the council decides that they'd like to change eight to 10 or 10 to eight and then they adopt all the changes to the bylaw. So in other words, we only voted on changing the 10 to eight. Now we have to vote on the full bylaw, okay? All right, so now we're going to the full bylaw uh, and I'm starting with um, Dorothy Pam. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Pam Rooney. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothman. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Okay. And that is unanimous with three absent. Um, there are three other items on the agenda tonight. They are the proposed flag policy, the proposed changes to town council policy regarding control and regulation of the public ways and proposed rescission of bylaw 3.35 parades and public meetings. These were all reviewed by GOL. This is not a night we were going to vote on them. It was a night you would basically ask any questions or anything else. So I'm going to quickly ask Pat, anything you wanna say about proposed flag policy? I'd like to say something about all of them together. If Thank that's you, possible. please go right ahead. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be briefly talking about the proposed uh, Amherst uh, flag policy, proposed changes to the town council policy regarding the control and regulation of the public way and the repeal and rescission of bylaw 3.35 parades and public meetings. And the reason I'm doing that is that since the Supreme uh, series of Supreme Judicial Court decisions regarding First Amendment and issues of government speech and free speech or public speech, the town manager and the DEI director created and proposed a flag policy. In addition to that, members of GOL and town staff began to review policies regarding the banners and flags flown in the business improvement district downtown, and also to look at bylaw 3.35 parades and public meetings. We determined that the limits of government speech 
required our policies to have clear and consistent regulations in place to avoid the perception of bias in decision making. The proposed flag policy and changes to the town policy regarding the control and regulation of the public way were reviewed by KP Law, whose advice and revisions guided our decisions. After extensive discussion, which focused on reservations on the common, use of the public ways, flying flags and banners, the following three motions were made. One, to recommend the town council adopt the amendments to the town policy regarding the control and regulation of the public ways. To recommend the town council rescind bylaw 3.35 parades and public meetings whose substance has been integrated into the policy regarding control and regulation. And also to recommend the town council adopt the flag raising policy as shown in the document memo to the town council flag raising policy dated 426. We also have a clean copy of the uh, flag policy in the packet. So I'm going to open it up to questions and I'm going to encourage all members of GOL to participate in answering those questions. And are there questions about the flag policy? Are there questions about the proposed changes to the town council policy regarding control and regulation of the public ways? Yes, Pam Rooney. Uh, could someone explain um, the delegation of authority to town manager versus town council and why, why it was split out in that manner? I'm going to look at either Pat or Mandy but, Jones. I, I was going to ask, do you have a specific which delegation? There's a lot of delegating in there. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I can give my interpretation, which is basically whenever it's short term, we say town, town manager, do it. When it's a longer term or more permanent, then we want it to the, come to the council. That's it. And do you want to I'm on GOL, so I can answer that question. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Wait, so we're not, I'm not hearing the people in the town room. Sorry about that, Jennifer. Um, so for banners and the flag policy, Paul and, um, and his staff proposed a flag policy that dealt with I think it was, was it Pamela? And Pamela um, through KP Law proposed a flag policy that dealt only with the flag pulls on the common. Um, but when we started getting into it, there's banners that go across North Pleasant and there's the banners, the decorative flags or banners in town. And so we tried to add that into the policy. And what we looked for there um, was, were there sections of those banners and and that, that that even though we were declaring everything government speech, which is the important thing to do, um, were there things that we could agree on were government speech that the town council would always allow? And so that was delegated off to the town manager. And those were things like, um, if you read it, the US flag, the Massachusetts flag, our town flag, um, the school flags, um, um, and then basically everything else. And then were there other ones? And so that's where we looked at the greeting. We we do a lot of like holiday greeting banners and welcome back and congratulations on graduating banners. And, and so that we put in there as a separate one, but that while government speech were, the GOL thought was sort of more ministerial that we as a council didn't need to see, but could still declare government speech and everything else we ran into problems with declaring it government speech, but giving the authority to the manager. So that means we're actually going to see a lot more stuff, um, including most of what goes across Pleasant Street. <laughs> because we couldn't, as GOL, figure out how to um, make it government speech, but also delegate it in a way that didn't put the manager in a weird situation or potentially put us in a weird situation. In terms okay. of the flag policy, from what? In terms of the flag policy, 
I believe it says in the flag policy, is this loud enough? <laughs> and that the town manager will be uh, organizing regulations and process. So he's very involved in this, but the decision um, about what is government speech and what gets put up there is definitely belongs to the council. Is that okay? Yeah. Pam, does that help? Thank you. Are there any questions about the proposed rescission of bylaws 3.3 bylaw 3.35 parades and public meetings? Can I say something about that in case Please. there are questions? Yes. One when we got um, the review from KP Law, we were looking specifically asking uh, KP Law about that bylaw, and that goes back to bylaw review. And the only thing that we can regulate around free speech issues, the First Amendment issues, we can time, place, and manner of such activities, in this instance, public meetings and parades. And if we are not consistent, um, and that's true also of the flag policy, that's where we're going to really get into trouble. So this is to make things as consistent as possible. And we don't need that bylaw anymore because it's, it literally has been integrated now into. Are there any questions from the council? These will come out back for a vote. Um, I probably will put them on consent for the vote um, on, the tw on the 17th. Okay. If someone has a question, they can pull it off consent. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We're going to move on to town council appointments because of the nature of the discussion at the um, CRC for regarding planning board, we made these into three separate motions. I'm going to begin in accordance with charter section 2.9C to appoint Fred Hartwell to the planning board for a term beginning July 1, 2023, expiring June 30th, 2026. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Okay, is there any question or comment? Um, may I make a report? Please. <laughs> so CRC had discussion. I'm gonna report on all three of these at once so I don't have to do this multiple times as, as chair. Um, CRC had, did the interviews, the reports in the, in the packet. Um, with a little bit of an explanation. Um, and in the end, after discussion, CRC voted to unanimously recommend Fred Hartwell and Jesse Mager um, to uh, three-year appointments and had a two in favor and three opposed to recommend um, Johanna Newman to reappointment for a three-year term. Okay. So... The initial motion's been made and seconded. Uh, it's regarding Fred Hartwell. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I'm going to move to the vote. I believe we're at Dorothy Pam. Uh, yes, Am Rooney. Thank you. Uh, aye. Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. And was absent. And Dorothy Pam. Yes. That is a, give must me 20, be 11. No, must be 10 in favor and three absent. We're moving to the next one in accordance with Charter Section 2.9C to appoint Jesse Mager to the planning board for a term beginning July 1, 2023 and expiring June 30th, 2026. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Mandy Jo? I'm making my comments not as chair, just so it's clear. Um, I can no longer support um, Jesse Mager for appointment to the planning board. And I want to be clear, it's not that he does not support the bylaw amendments that Pat and I has proposed. Um, he signed that 
that paper, the, the letter that we received, and it's his act of signing, not his lack of support that concerns me. At the time he signed it, the hearing was still ongoing at the planning board. And if it is not ongoing anymore, but he signed a document to the planning board where he might have sat on the hearing board itself. Um, the document he signed had obvious factual errors that anyone reading the actual proposal and having a minimal amount of zoning understanding would recognize as incorrect immediately. This is, and that it deals with the claim in the letter that the proposal would quote, eliminate a butter notifications for duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, and converted dwellings, which is nearly 100% wrong. And anyone who reads the proposal would know immediately that it was nearly 100% wrong. And so I find Mr. Maker's signing of a document without doing due diligence to a board he wished to sit on as something that I can no longer support because of his lack of due diligence and clear lack of willingness to actually read the proposal before signing it, or at least get a modicum of understanding of what it is before um, putting forward an opinion to oppose it. So it is not his opposition in and of itself. And I just wanna be clear about that. It is his lack of due diligence to signing um, before signing it that presents a problem for me. Okay, are there any other comments at this time? Anna? Can I ask a clarifying question? Please. I apologize if you said this. Um, in terms of the timing of this, this is not something that we would have the opportunity to ask this person about any clarifying questions, correct? Like we can't. The interviews are closed. Right, and they had closed prior to this petition, okay. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Then I'm going to move to a vote and I believe it's Andy. No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Uh, I have. I am concerned with this lack of due diligence, but I am going to go forward with vote for some aye. Anna Devlin Gothner. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, no. With reservations and aye. Mandy Jo Haneke? No. Anika Lopes? With reservations, aye. Uh, Pam, uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. It is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in favor, two opposed, three absent. Next one. In accordance with Charter Section 2.9C to appoint Johanna Newman to the Planning Board for a term beginning July 1, 2023 and expiring June 30th, 2026. Is there a second? Second, second DeAngelis. Okay. okay. Uh, are there comments or questions? I would like to make a, a, a short statement. Please. Um, I did not support Ms. Newman in the meeting. Uh, I voted against recommending her. Um, I have some reasons in terms of what I felt like were um, misunderstandings or distortions of positions, uh, particularly around the solar moratorium. Um, and I wouldn't have brought up the solar moratorium, but Ms. Newman brought it up in her statement of interest and in her responses. Uh, but the more I thought about it, uh, the more I felt like if I could accept Jesse Mager, then I needed to be able to accept Johanna, who has worked uh, thoughtfully, frequently on the, on the committee, and who, who has made a real commitment to the work. So I would like to see people support her. Yeah. Other, yes, Andy. Yeah, I also want to speak in favor of uh, Anna. Um, I was really um, very upset by the recommendation of the committee. 
um, because I, we have a member of the planning board who has worked diligently as exceptional understanding of energy um, and uh, the whole subject of environmental regulation and uh, solar that she brings a level um, of expertise that is equal equally important to Mr. Hartwell's uh, expertise that he was bringing from working in um, construction and, and as an electrician. So it, it seemed like a real double standard. Um, and uh, furthermore, I was really concerned about picking out a statement from the SOI and making what I think was a very unfair um, and incorrect assumption of what was meant by that uh, statement with that. And uh, it, it just didn't strike me that a same standard was been applied in other situations um, to other applicants um, to just go to, and uh, it's really a, uh, a question that we need people who are looking at a balance as we just talked about with another candidate who are going to look at the whole range of what it is that we need in order to have diversified housing that will bring housing opportunities to lower income um, uh, people than might otherwise be able to afford housing under current rules and can balance that against um, the uh, other needs that we have in town. Um, zoning has been frequently um, something that has become a barrier. And this is not just an Amherst situation. This is nationally. This is the way zoning works. has been a barrier to um, po people in poverty being able to have housing opportunities. And um, I hope that we um, continue to welcome planning board members who have a very uh, wide-ranging understanding of those complex issues. Dorothy? Okay. Uh, first of all, I think we have to separate a person's talents and abilities and their performance on a committee. Uh, I enjoy reading uh, Joanna Neumann's, um, Newman's articles in the paper, uh, and I have absolutely no doubt of her expertise. However, um, I believe I've attended more um, planning board meetings than um, most other town councilors, and I thought that she had stopped being on the committee. Uh, she was absent so many times, and um, often she would be there, but would offer no comments, no construction, no, no, no questions even. Uh, com so to, compared to the other planning board members, it was clear that this was not a first priority. So I, I do not in any way um, derogate her positions, her training, her knowledge, her abilities. But if you wanna be on a board, and particularly a board as crucial as the planning board, you have to really participate and do the work. And um, you have to do the site inspections, you have to attend the meetings. You have to read the documents. You have to question the documents. And that's uh, where um, I saw a problem. So uh, I think it does make sense to have, um, I know that that leaves a vacancy, um, but people who are on the planning board, it's, it's a job. Well, I say it's as hard as being a town counselor. I'm not going to say quite that, but it's a hard job. It's a very, very important job. And you have to have somebody that has wants to do the job and has the time to do the job and is willing to do the job. And that is what's most of concern to me, not questions of, 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 of opinions. Thank you. Pam Rooney. Uh, Dorothy, Dorothy attended probably more planning board meetings than I did, um, so, but I'm number two. Um, I, I value Johanna for her expertise in energy. I would love to see her on ECAC where her knowledge and expertise could be immediately put into use. Um, I, I have to echo, I have to echo everything that Dorothy said. Um, 
I don't think any of us want to disparage candidates or make it so onerous that they can't participate. But I needed to I needed to respond to um, what Andy said. I don't think anyone took things out of the statement of interest that weren't then contradicted by statements that were made in response to some of the questions. And I think that's where um, it was some of the responses and uh, were more divisive than I would have liked to have seen. Um, and I and I agree wholeheartedly that someone who sits on that planning in that planning, position needs to be an active member, um, someone who analyzes everything, considers all the ramifications, and um, oftentimes Ms. Newman would listen to a presentation from the developer and then just say, I support it. I think we could vote right now. Um, and, and that's not the way I think planning should be um, managed. Jennifer. <clears throat> um, with we're not, I don't want to repeat what's been said. Um, and I also feel I don't like to, um, you know, publicly um, in, you know, question how somebody has performed on a board that makes me uncomfortable. But since we're voting, um, I have also been zooming into planning board meetings for three years. And I, I find you know, one of my concerns is that kind, is the uh, uncritically questioning many of the applications that come before the planning board for approval. And you know, like with these this sweeping package of zoning um, proposed zoning revisions, no matter what your position is for or against for some you know whatever your position is on those revisions, they were an ex extremely, they are an extremely complex set of zoning revisions that required a lot of consideration. And when the sponsors presented them for the first time at the planning board meeting on February 1st, all the members of the planning board meeting were, were talking about how, what kind of a deep dive were they going to take to really wrap their you know, minds around and understand the full magnitude and implication and impact of all these different changes. Some members said, well, maybe we should look at, you know, different zoning districts and, you know, how the change in duplexes will affect each zoning district, or should we look at just duplexes and triplexes, you know, divide those up and see, you know, how they apply townwide. There was a lot of discussion about how to even begin to think about these propo this proposal. And at the end of the meeting, when Ms. Newman spoke, she said, uh, you know, that she would not like to see it sliced up. She thought it should be, you know, accepted. And um, she even said it was a comprehensive nudge, not a leap. And I thought, you know, just hearing this proposal, it was like there was 40 slides on the PowerPoint. And just to say, let's accept it, that seemed um, not giving it. And that's an example of kind of the consideration it was due. And then, you know, she, frequently describes, you know, neighborhoods in my district as transitional uh, neighborhoods, which feels a little demeaning. And um, so yeah, I, I just, I could not vote um, in good conscience for her to, for a second term. Um, you know, that for that it is my main consideration is how um, the, the deep analysis and thought about much of what comes before the board and then her characterization of, I think, neighborhoods in my district as transitional neighborhoods um, and then people averse to change who have different opinions. Um, I would like to see more open-mindedness um, on members of, of such an important body as the planning board. Mandy Jo. I wanna support everything that Pat and Andy said, but I wanna add something else about what critical review of proposals means and what participation in a meeting means. Just because someone doesn't speak very often at a meeting doesn't mean they haven't read the materials. 
it doesn't mean that they haven't critically thought about those materials. And it doesn't mean they've gone through in their head, haven't gone through in their head, what the ramifications are. It might just mean they've done all of that and believe they don't have any questions left because they've thought it all through. Or it might mean every other planning board member or member of that committee has asked their questions and they don't need to. I sat on the Charter Commission for 18 months and there was at least one Charter Commission member that rarely spoke at the meeting. But when he did, you knew he had read everything, he had thought of it, he had done both sides of every argument and he knew what he was talking about and he was fully participating. He didn't need to speak to be able to make that decision. And so to, to say just because someone speaks doesn't mean they're thinking critically about an issue, I think takes someone's participation, assumes something about a, participant's, a person's participation that is not necessarily accurate. Um, that's all I have to say. Anna. I, I plan to enthusiastically support Johanna's appointment, especially because of her expertise. Those with climate action knowledge are needed on all of our committees, not just ECAC. If we are limiting our climate experts to ECAC, gosh, are we screwed, right? I was actually really disappointed and have a, an email drafted to Mandy that there wasn't a question in the CRC interview about climate. Climate and planning, climate action and planning need to go together. That's alarming to me. So heads up and emails coming. Honestly, I wish some of us would take a page from Johanna's book and consider what we are saying about a human being and how they process information in this meeting right now. I would like to gently, and it's close to 11, so I recognize I'm being a little less gentle, but I, I think all of us need to check how we are speaking publicly about our neighbors and do it with kindness and empathy. Being loud or talkative and being unprepared are two very different things. I have been part of many meetings where I have been extremely prepared, but I haven't felt the need to add my input to make them go longer. There are lots of ways to engage and ask questions. There have been plenty of times where each member of this council separately has said a lot and times where they have said little. I agree we should explain our positions, but to say someone is not doing their job because they do not share their full process and only their final decision is alarming and shocking to me. Pat. Thank you. Uh, I wanna go back to the first meeting in February that you brought up, Jennifer. Um, I, don't, I, I totally trust you about what Johanna said, but I also went through the whole process with her and she wasn't in the same place at the end. Um, that she was in the beginning. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to listen, observe, et cetera. Uh, I didn't get the support from her that I would like for what we've been proposing. She did propose that there were some elements that were worth voting on separately, but that was not the will of the planning board. Um, and, and so I feel like uh, your example falls really short because what I've seen in her in this instance, if we're again, where I didn't get my way, but in this instance where she uh, processed things, changed things and had different input. So I'm going to support her. Dorothy. Okay. This is a public body. This is a public discussion. No one is going to be a good town councilor because they have a great interior process unless they share that process with other council members. The public has a right to know. I have attended so many meetings of the planning board and that moment never came when all of a sudden you got the benefit of it. She looked bored. She did not. Seriously, I am not talking about her as a person. I'm talking purely about performance on a crucial board in the town. And the, that performance wasn't there. Um, so if, if you wanna play it this way, you can. Um, and I, and I, I understand defending a friend is good. And I in no way um, say anything bad about her ability. She's a great writer. She's got great ideas and wonderfully. 
but she, did she engage with the material? Did she did she listen to? Did was there any sense that she was even listening to the other members of the planning board? No, there wasn't. So, you know, at some point you can't just be called a musician because you're thinking great musical thoughts. You have to produce some music, and it doesn't have to be all the time, but it has to be sometime. And I didn't see it, so I think it was a reasonable vote that was taken, and. Um, you know, I do, I, Anna, that's a really good point about wanting to have people with climate knowledge on all committees. I totally agree with you. But you would want them to share that knowledge. What good are they doing on the committee if they have this special knowledge and they don't share it? And there was no sharing going on. So um, I, I think that this is a, a reasonable decision uh, that the planning board is not the, the town body uh, for Joanna. But does she have great talents and abilities? Yes but I think another body would be better. Thank you. Andy. I have to uh, comment, uh, Dorothy. I'm sorry that uh, if I look at this group itself, I wonder sometimes whether people are looking bored here. Um, and uh, it, it, how, how do you judge that when you look at people? Uh, but the other, the thing that I was really, uh, had raised my hand was uh, Jennifer raised, um, brought up that, term the transitional neighborhood and i think that that was probably the thing that really triggered me off to begin with because i'm not sure um, there's so many ways that that can be interpreted for meaning and i kind of just felt that it was uh, not it was not reasonable to make an assumption about what that meant for somebody who has served on the planning board, has developed the expertise, has the presumption that we built into our rules that presumes reappointment, and that I think that uh, um, obviously a presumption is a presumption, but not a final decision. But I think that we created that for a reason, and. Uh, for, for the, that variety of reasons, I, I really felt like um, this was uh, one that um, there was not reasons put forward that don't have us go with the presumption that we had built in the rule. I think that's why we have it. Anika. Uh, yes, just, just to be brief, I think, you know, not everyone is here to perform, and I, I would. I think it would serve us well to stop um, describing the inner workings of people we don't know as as if we do. Um, and I understand the language of transitional might be um, offensive, and you know if if that's how it felt to you, Jennifer, then it was. But I think that there's also a bit of um, we can't be hypocrites because it's you know um, in, in to Andy's point that could be taken a, a different way. Um, as can saying slums and ghettos can be, but these are, you know, freely, um, they're tossed around as well in describing Amherst neighborhoods. So I just, I think that we need to be careful and just make sure that we are um, showing those grace. It's, it's not easy to be involved with these committees or at all. So thank you. That's it. Jennifer. Yeah. Um, <sighs> So, uh, Pat, I guess I would just say that, you know, maybe you felt the, this planning board member may have changed a little, you know, may have asked for some changes over time as the planning board continued to hold its deliberations over, you know, a few months. But my sense is she would have just accepted it lock, stock and barrel at that first meeting. Based on what she said, I went back and listened to the meeting based on what she said. She said that she hoped it, but I'm not gonna repeat that. I said it before. Um, so I guess I would just ask in terms of some grace because I think she will be, um, you know, probably voted onto the board that a little more um, grace towards the neighborhoods in my district because over a period of years, I have heard my district referred to as we're averse to change, even though we have all the changes that were in those zoning um, re proposed revisions. That we are a neighbor, we are a neighborhood where people live, 
we're not an investment opportunity. Um, so I would ask, you know, this member for some grace when she's looking at uh, some of the neighborhoods uh, closer to town. Thank you. I'm going to call the question. Question's been called. Move to immediate vote on whether to call the question, and then we're going on. Um, this is Jennifer. Also, what, what point of order or clarification? Did you actually make a motion to call the question? I move to call the. Then question. I will second it. Thank you. Thank you. And so now the vote now is we, on whether we we're vote. ending debate. Thank you. Uh, but we have to vote on whether to end debate. Yeah, okay. All right, Jennifer, voting to end debate. Yes. Alicia. Yes. Pat. Aye. Anna Devlin Gother. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Pam Rooney. I mean, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Okay, we're going to move to the question. We start with Alicia Walker. So we're voting. Whether or not to vote Johanna Newman onto the planning board for a term beginning July 1 of this year and expiring June 30th, 2026. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Pam uh, Dorothy Pam. No. Pam Rooney. No. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. No. Okay, that is seven in favor, three opposed, three absent. We're going to move on to the zoning board. Um, so in accordance with charter section 2.9 C to appoint Everald Henry and Philip White as members to the Zoning Board of Appeals for terms effective July 1, 2023 and expiring June 30th, 2026. Is there a second? Second. Are there any comments or questions? Do you want a quick report? Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. And I had your I had your name on this piece of paper, but not here. Pam, please give us a quick report. You wrote a nice report, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I copied Mandy's text. <laughs> Long and the short, there were five candidates that submitted statements of interest. We have two full-time member positions open. We have four associate member positions open. And we initially went into the interviews with the suggestion that uh, we would at least try to appoint the full-time members. And if we were able, and if we had qualified members of candidates that we would also fill associate members as, as possible. Uh, we ended up making the recommendation that you see on the, on the motion with, a lot of discussion. Thank you. Anything else? Would you like to make any other comment? I, I just wanted to add one thing yeah. that doesn't relate to that discussion. The third motion on the motion sheet is not necessary tonight regarding the extension of term right. for Dylan Maxfield because that hearing has closed. So we don't need to make that motion. I just wanted to put that out there for everyone so they knew why we were skipping it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so are we ready to move to a vote? Yes. Uh, I think we're back up to Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. It's unanimous with three absent. The next motion is in accordance with Charter Section 2.9A, 2.9C, to appoint Hilda Greenbaum 
Greenbaum, David Sloviter, and Sarah Marshall as associate members to the Zoning Board of Appeals for terms effective July 1, 2023 and expiring June 30th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. Is there any question or comment? Was, do you have any further report? Okay. My, my hand is not long up. Mandy Jo? So I just wanted to make the statement um, that I will be voting as a group for these, despite my concerns about um, David Sloviter's signatures on that same petition for the same reasons. But since he does not sit on the planning board and it has that slight difference that um, for that reason, I will still vote to appoint all three. Okay. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Pam. I would also like to state that I strongly supported promoting David Sloviter and Sarah Marshall to the full-time positions because they have spent the past at least six months to a year serving as associate members. And that was one of the strongest criteria that our uh, ZBA chair offered to the committee. Um, I voted to go the route that we are for unanimity. Um, Jennifer. Um, I, I would say, you know, echoing Pam, I also um, stated during the meeting that I thought um, the two associate members, David Sulverter and Sarah Marshall, who had served as associates for a year, um, had served in good standing, and I supported their moving on as full-time members. Um, and I think that's kind of off in the route. And then I supported the three other uh, candidates to be associate members. And I just wanted to note that, um, I don't know if you all had a chance to read the letter that or email that came into the council from Steve Judge, the chair of the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, who, you know, he has said, expressed that, you know, he thinks that from what he read um, of the statement of interest that they were all strong candidates, but he really appreciated, would appreciate having the two associate members advance to full-time members so that they could hit the ground running. So I just, you know, thought we should acknowledge that we had received that letter and, um, you know, that I really shared, um, you know, that point at the, I, I, I shared that position, but, um, you know, after the contentiousness, I guess, um, when we were um, from our June 12th meeting for the CRC, which was three days before for the planning board, um, I did ultimately go for unanimity, but, um, you know, I'm not totally comfortable with my, I, with that decision, but that's where. Pat. Yes, I just want to say that my first choices, since we seem to be sharing those with Philip White, and Sarah Marshall. Um, I chose Philip because he has a background uh, in architecture, uh, not architecture, but uh, zoning um, and land uh, use and design uh, that he uh, is involved with in economic development strategy, and, uh, how planning impacts that. He And so I was quite interested in him. Um, and I felt strongly about Sarah. What I, I don't, I didn't guess, I didn't feel like things were contentious, but I, I did feel like he had come to a collaboration um, that, that uh, so, uh, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm talking about the surprised board by meeting. the reaction because it, it, it even, uh, I think I even said, or somebody else said, um, Let's let's collaborate on this. Let, maybe that's not the word, um, but to com compromise, um, to to reach a compromise. Like we were. And so, so I want to stand. Decision. Uh, I think all of us should because we made it. But however you want to. No, Jennifer. No, I was referring to the June twelfth meeting being a little contentious not the June 15th. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Okay. All right, the motion. But 
fear of contention shouldn't make one make decisions. I know. That they I don't, don't really want. like contention. <laughs> okay. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there any other people who feel they have to comment? Dorothy? Um, the chair of the committee wants more members, full time associate, whatever, because the work of the zoning committee, ZBA, is, is quite arduous. And I don't believe that the chair had any objections or criticisms of the functioning of um, Sloviter and Marshall. So I just think it would be a good idea to um, do what was originally done to have them be full-time members and the others coming on as associates because there's, there's a lot of positions, a lot of work that has to be done by the ZBA. and um, it, when you listen to the CBA meetings, they're very well behaved. People talk, share opinions. Um, they're not contentious, um, but they're full. I mean, ideas are discussed. Um, so I, I would, you know, sometimes I guess I'm saying kind of maybe remove some politics and let a committee that works have its full strength. Thank Andy you, Joe. I echo what other members of our committee have said is that I believe this is a, we've already voted Philip and Everald onto as full members, but but that the recommendation coming out of CRC in some sense was a compromise recommendation that tried to get us to a unanimous recommendation. I think we sometimes always strive for that. We don't always get there. And given the number of applicants we had, we were able to get there. And I think it might not make everyone happy, um, including some of us that proposed the compromise solution there. Each of us might've had a different set of people we would have liked to see for three-year terms, but we got to a compromise solution. It was unanimous. Um, I do wanna say one thing as to one of the reasons I was concerned um, with um, appointing the two current associate members that applied for um, appointment or reappointment to the ZBA and, and sought three-year terms or one-year terms, but every all five people who applied preferred a three-year term. We asked them that. Um, was that if we had done that, all five members of the ZBA would have been from District 4. And one of the criteria that the ZBA chair has actually put forth um, as important to the ZBA is geographic diversity in town. Um, and so it just did concern me that all five members, full members that had the first right to sit on every ZBA panel um, would be from the exact same district, which also happens to be the very smallest district in our town. Um, so that was something that went into my consideration of potentially seeking a compromise um, vote and recommendation. Jennifer. Not to belabor, but um, I, the, there's many criteria. I mean, one is experience and one is geographic diversity, but you can be in the same council district, I just wanna be clear, and have geographic diversity. Um, the new district four, so the two council, the two members that, would be advanced that two current associate members, if they had advanced, they right now live in different council districts. They will be in the future in the new district four, but they're in different parts of town. Just like um, the new district five goes from Amherst Woods to downtown. So I don't think just going forward, we should say you can't be in the same council district because you can be in the same council district and live in very different neighborhoods. Just wanted to add that. Unless there's any other comment, I'd like to move to a vote without having to call the question. Thank you. Um, I think we're at Anna Devlin Gothier. Anna Devlin Gothier votes yes. Greece, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous with three absent.
We are done with the votes for the evening. Each of you have submitted various reports, but just let me ask. Mandy Jo, CRC? I believe you've heard enough from CRC tonight. Okay. El Elementary School Building Committee, Kathy's already gone. Alicia, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, we haven't had another meeting yet. I know that on July 10th, we're going to have a site visit and visit, look at the site together with the, with the design team. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm not sure if one of the other subcommittees had another meeting, Paul, I'm not sure if you know. Both, both subcommittees are meeting the same day. Okay, yes, so that we don't have any updates, but thank you. Paul, is there anything else? No. Okay, uh, finance, uh, finance committee, Andy. No report. Uh, GOL, Pat. You've heard enough from me. Uh, Jones Library, Anika. Okay, I'm going to refer to Paul for just, just a question. I'm not sure if I'm blurring from another report or I don't know that we've met, but our, the last meeting was after our last council meeting or before. Do you remember? You've met since then. We have because okay. we did the conservation commission appointments. Okay, that's right. So uh, yes, we we did hear about um, the the architects are coming in. Um, they were conservative with their estimate, but they're coming in on and under budget. Yeah, I got it. I think that he. I, it was both. It was both. I got it. But we did meet. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no, 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 I got it. And I, I understood that he was saying TSO, but meant the JLBC. <laughs> and, we, and then there was another allotment that came in that I'm sure everyone has heard about from, uh, state representative Mindy Dom and Senator Joe Comerford. So, um, that's, that's about it for the Jones library. Okay, now TSO. Okay, so so TSO is also, I think we can, uh, you know, skip through street lights. Um, we're going to be talking about that next meeting, um, hopefully with prepared amendments, if there are any in advance. And uh, I will refer, uh, defer to Paul for an update on the hauler policy. Sorry, it so is late. Yeah, so we call the waste hauler policy. We're supposed to send the RFI out this week by the end of June. So that's the goal. And, and Mr. Maureen said that's his mission before he goes on vacation to get it out. So, okay. Thank you for that. Are there any liaison reports? Moving right along, approval <laughs> minutes. We, <laughs> any town, man town manager, anything else, Paul? No. No. Wow. Okay. President's report. You got one. And it's got a ton of testimony in it because that was basically last week. Mandy Jo also testified at the ranked choice voting hearing. Thank you, Mandy Jo. Yes. Question. Um, future agenda items. That's what my hands are. Future for. agenda items. Yes. Um, I got to go all the way down the charter review committee charge. What's up yes. with that? <laughs> is is it coming to the council at some point yes. or <laughs> thank you it's uh i'm writing myself a note thank you i think we should be looking at that no later than july if not august okay anything else what i have on for the for july 17th besides all the various things that we discussed tonight uh, one is Paul is going to come forward with some ideas about how we might look at uh, systematically at issues like traffic calming and public ways. Um, we are hopefully going to be looking at either from GOL, either the bylaws from the first council or the rules of procedure. 
We're doing one in July, one in August. Uh, hopefully we'll have something on the reproductive care bylaw. Yes, if ready. Yeah, okay. And we don't know when we'll get to duplexes, but it could be as early as the 17th. And that's it. Is there any other questions or comments, future agenda items? Seeing no hands, the meeting is adjourned. It is 1124. I just ruined my record. But you were doing so well before this. No.